And I believe that you have a short statement that you would like to make to the committee. So if you could make your brief introduction and the statement, uh, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Lex Greensill. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important hearing to answer your questions. And I hope to provide clarity and greater understanding of the issues before us. Please understand that I bear complete responsibility for the collapse of Greensville Capital. I am desperately saddened that more than a thousand very hardworking people have lost their jobs at Greensville. Likewise, I take full responsibility for any hardship being felt by our clients and their suppliers, and indeed investors in our programs. It's deeply regrettable that we were let down by our leading insurer whose actions assured Greensill's collapse, and indeed by some of our biggest customers. To all of those affected by this, I am truly sorry. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for that. Could I take you back to a very specific moment in time, to the 12th of July, 2019, when you had a meeting in your offices just off the Strand, I believe, with Lord Miners. I believe this was a meeting or he described as being about an hour and a quarter, but whatever length it was, it was a fairly lengthy uh, meeting. And when he gave evidence to this committee, uh, he uh, left us strongly with the impression that he had had a meeting with you in which he had expressed disquiet about the uh, business model that you were following. Uh, he told us that when he left the meeting, uh, when he'd gone down in the lift afterwards and he was thinking about it, into his mind came the idea that uh, what was going on here was, uh, and I am paraphrasing him, tantamount to a Ponzi scheme, as he described it. Um, could you just tell the committee a little bit about that meeting? Uh, what kind of uh, concerns Lord Miners raised with you about the structure of the business and the model of business uh, as it was, and what uh, answers you were able to provide him to try and reassure him that actually Greensill uh, was a viable and, uh, and, and sensible business? Certainly, Mr Chairman. I, I think I would say at the outset that uh, I was very surprised to hear the evidence that Lord Miners provided to this committee two weeks ago. Uh, and it is not consistent with my recollection uh, of uh, the events. Uh, my recollection of the events, and I have checked my records uh, before addressing you today, uh, is that Lord Miners was the chairman of Edelman, who was a communications firm that uh, represented my firm and through them, uh, he requested uh, a, an appointment with me, and you're correct that, uh, that he met with me uh, on the 12th of July, uh, 2019. Uh, that was in response to questions that he had raised uh, in the House of Lords uh, concerning um, the, uh, the way in which certain open-ended uh, investment vehicles operated and the liquidity that they provided and the mismatch between those and, and the underlying assets. Um, we had that meeting. Uh, obviously, it was a meeting we took incredibly seriously given um, Lord Miners' position and, uh, and the positions that he previously held. Um, I felt that we had a constructive discussion where I was able to uh, discuss and explain the differences between uh, the assets that he had been talking about uh, in his questions that he had raised in Parliament uh, and those of working capital finance or supply chain finance assets, which have importantly different characteristics, largely because the duration or the period of time that the, the assets uh, are outstanding is very short. They match receivables, uh, which get paid very, very quickly. Um, and so self-liquidate. Um, I thought we had a constructive uh, discussion uh, and we talked about uh, um, the fact that as we grew, um, we were going to move into um, ever more regulated spaces. He noted, um, uh, as I told him about our plans for the future, that we really didn't have any advisors or directors 
with any substantive regulatory experience. And I suggested to him that we could benefit from his experience uh, and he seemed very amenable to that. Um, I said that he clearly would want to do more work to, uh, to understand our business. And indeed that was followed with a subsequent meeting that he had together with my chairman uh, on the 3rd of September. Um, but I think uh, an important detail. Sorry, let's, let's stop you there, just on that point. So the meeting on the 3rd of September with the chairman, are you saying that Lord Miners, Miners uh, attended that specifically with the purpose of discussing the potential, uh, potentially joining your board or joining as an advisor of Greensill? Was that, that the, the reason? That, that and clearly continuing his diligence in understanding our business and, uh, and, and our activities. But I, I would like to read to you, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, a, a statement which was sent to me that was prepared by Lord Miners after our meeting on the 12th of July that he proposed to make. But in fact, we collectively decided not to publish that statement simply because the reality was um, the matter was practically closed. However, I think it's now relevant for me to read you that statement uh, that Lord Miners uh, provided uh, um, to, uh, to us in, in writing. Um, my question, and I'll read, I, I quote, and this was provided on the 13th of July. My, my question in Parliament was linked to open-ended funds and illiquidity. I have asked many other questions of the same issue in my time in Parliament. In the light of press commentary, I took it upon myself to meet with Lex Greensill to discuss his business. I found him very open and following the meeting, I am comfortable with the business and its operations. I heard and saw nothing that would warrant the use of the word fraudulent or anything similar. Okay. He, okay. Then, he then met with, with my chairman and I on the 3rd of September he then subsequently uh, attended, I believe it was a breakfast with just my chairman on the 18th of September and wrote a very complimentary note directly to me afterwards, which I can share with the committee if required. Um, and then on the 7th of October, Lord Miners wrote to my chairman and I, and I will read that, that uh, short email to you if I may, Dear Lex and Morris, congratulations on securing further backing from SoftBank, a powerful endorsement from a global investor of standing. Last week, I had a coronary angiogram at Hammersmith Hospital. The consultant surgeon has advised me to reduce my workload. In the circumstances, I think I must decline your interesting idea and not waste your time by commencing any detailed diligence. I wish you well, regards, Paul. Okay, can I just go back to the statement that you read us uh, from Lord Miners? Just to be absolutely clear, is that a statement that he produced and provided to you? In other words, it was authored by his own hand in one form or another. It was sent to me by Edelman and they said that it was sent to them by Lord Miners. And can you tell us who this middle person is? Uh, yes, I, I would be happy to provide that in writing subsequent to, uh, to this discussion. Okay, fine. Going back to that meeting on the 12th of July, was there anybody else present in that meeting other than yourself and Lord Miners? No, the meeting of the 12th of July was simply Lord Miners and I. Okay. On the 2nd of November, Lord Miners, I noticed, submitted a, 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 another written question uh, in the House, this time about uh, bounce back loans, but and also probing the issue of uh, GFG uh, Alliance, etc. So he certainly at that point, which of course is after the 7th of October, when he broke off the discussions with you, I guess, was back to being concerned about it. Um, is that... All right, sorry, do, do carry on. Is that 2019, Mr. Chairman? I, I beg your pardon, you're quite right. Um, it's not 2019, it's 2020, you're quite right. I think you'll find, Mr. Chairman, that uh, yeah. um, Lord Miners 
uh, didn't actually submit any further questions concerning Greensill Capital uh, until the 22nd of June, 2020. So 11 months after he met with me. When he met with your chairman, uh, Lex, on the 3rd, and I think again on the 18th for, for the breakfast, was that, uh, do you have minutes of, the, of those meetings? Does the chairman keep a record of what was discussed? Do you have any correspondence around the setting up of that meeting, uh, particularly in respect of what the purpose of the meeting was for, which I think you're suggesting was to further discussions about Lord Miners potentially becoming involved with Greensill in some form? Uh, I can certainly look and see what correspondence and, and uh, minute material we have available and come back to you in writing on that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that, uh, for that uh, evidence. Can I uh, ask you sort of more, more general question then? What, what in your view went wrong? Why did uh, Greensill fail uh, in, at the end of the day? What were the reasons for that? Yes. The, the ultimate failure of Greensill... Um, was for one reason, but as ever, there are always associated reasons. But the reason that Greensill ultimately failed um, is because a material portion of our funding, Mr. Chairman, is provided uh, by investors uh, who um, require insurance together with that asset that they purchase um, to protect them against the default of that uh, of, of the, the underlying receivables. Uh, our principal insurance provider uh, decided not to renew their insurance, despite being in discussions around renewing their insurance up to the hours before ultimately Credit Suisse determined they no longer would fund our business, which was roughly a week before we went into administration. Um, and it was that withdrawal of insurance capacity which resulted in our failure. Now, of course, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the reason, you, I'm sure you will ask me, what was the reason for the withdrawal of that insurance capacity? And I think that really comes down to uh, three things. First, COVID. It had an impact on the entire insurance industry and on specific customers of ours. Uh, and indeed, I recognise that this body is considering what uh, changes may be necessary to regulation. And I have some views about uh, which you, you may wish. To Just to ask you on, on that, Lex, what, what, what precise date was the insurance cover terminated uh, within the arrangement? Uh, it expired at the beginning of March uh, 2021. Right. OK. And... So, uh, so the, the first is uh, COVID had an impact both on the insurance industry itself and on many of our customers. Two, as you'll be aware, we did have some concentrations and indeed those are a source of regret to me with respect to some of our larger customers, um, which no doubt you'll want to talk about. Um, and three, uh, the actions of um, our, the regulator of Greensill Bank in Germany um, created uncertainty with respect to our ability to continue to support and provide liquidity uh, for, for, key, for a, a key customer that, uh, that relied upon us. Okay. If I sort of look at what, what's out there or was out there in the public domain, I'm thinking now 2019, uh, basically, uh, sort of if, if you were looking from the outside and you were uh, looking for things that might cause concern about the business. On the 18th of March, the FT reported that Tim Hayward, who you'll be familiar with, was, was fired from uh, GAM, one of the investors providing uh, finance to uh, the business, um, and who provided, I think, hundreds of millions of dollars in financing. And look at the links Tim Harwood uh, had uh, with yourself and Sanjeev Gupta. Um, we then have the various written questions from Lord Miners. We have one on the 10th of June. On the 7th of July 2019, report, uh, Reuters reported that Greensill issued a full statement on Gupta bonds relating to guarantees provided by the Scottish uh, Government. Uh, on the 8th of July, analysts and bloggers Stephen Clapham and Mark Rubenstein wrote a blog on, the Greens on Greensill entitled uh, Greensill Soft Bank and Cooking the Books. 
Um, we then have uh, on the 4th of May, uh, sorry, we skip forward to 2020 now, uh, FT reports that Greensill had suffered a, a raft of client defaults and that Greensill and credit insurers were having to cover losses in funds managed by Credit Suisse. Then we have a, a number of additional during June and as we've already mentioned in November on the 2nd and the 18th questions from Lord Miners. What was your reaction to all of those things? And at what point did you in that timeline perhaps think there's something going on here in this business that I'm getting really quite concerned about? Sure. So if one were to think about the, the, the year of 2020, uh, I, I guess there were a number of things that uh, at various points uh, registered concern uh, with, with, with me. Can I go um, back to 2019, though? What, what were you feeling back at the time that uh, Tim Hayward was fired from GAM and there were suggestions of a close relationship between him and Greens Greensill and yourself and you, you know the details? What, uh, what were you thinking at that point? If I can take you back a bit earlier than 2020. I, I can't comment on matters as between Mr. Hayward and his employer. Uh, what I would note is that, in fact, every investor in any of his funds received more than par, um, and there was no loss on any assets associated with Greensville Capital uh, by by GAM. But I, I think any matter concerning Mr. Hayward himself, I, I can't uh, I can't specifically comment on. Um, and, and I think you'll find that that event actually didn't take place in 2019, but but took place before that. Um, but uh, so I think he was he was dismissed, was he not, uh, in March 2019 or thereabouts? Actually, February, I think, the 21st of February, GAM announces the firing of Tim Hayward for gross misconduct. But let's get back to the question. So the, the question, the, the number of the question is: At what point along this timeline from early 2019? onwards do you start to think this business is is not really as stable as i would like it to be and, I, and i've got growing concerns about it what was the moment in time when that came to came to your mind would you say sure i think the the, the first event that gave me concern although not for our company because we just recently received um, more than a billion dollars worth of uh, of equity investment into our company but i certainly had reservations and concerns about the state of the capital markets uh, during March, April and May 2020. You'll appreciate it as, and if you cast your mind back, uh, you'll remember that the, the capital markets at that time were roiled uh, by um, the uncertainty of, uh, of, of COVID and none of us knew what exactly was going to come next. As, it, as, uh, as you're probably aware, um, although Greensill was funded by more than 50 banks um, and several dozen, dozen institutional investors. Um, one didn't know what was going to happen in the future. As it was, we were able to continue to support all of the supply chains and meet every supplier's requirement throughout the, uh, the disruption that took place then. But we didn't know, no one knew what was going to happen next. So so are, are you basically saying then, so during 2019, largely you were, you were aware of various rumblings going on and press, um, adverse press comments, etc., some of which we've touched on, but you were basically um, feeling uh, positive about the business. It was really once the pandemic struck, so around May, uh, a little bit earlier than May, I guess, uh, that you start to think, hold on a minute, this might not be as stable uh, as I would like it to be. Would that be a fair summary? Actually, I, I would say that for our business didn't require that liquidity. The liquidity I'm speaking of and the conditions of the capital markets uh, affects our customers, not Greensill, the company itself. But obviously it's important that we continue to support those customers. The first concern that I had about the position of Greensill, the company, as opposed to would COVID have an impact on the capital markets and therefore impact our clients, um, was in December 2020. And in mid-December 2020, um, our German regulator proposed a uh, reduction plan with respect to um, the amount of exposure that we held for one of our customers 
that was going to be impossible for us to comply with. Uh, and obviously that position was disclosed to the investors. We were doing a capital raise um, for, for equity for our own company at the time to, to fund our continued growth. We disclosed that to um, the investors and that meant that the capital raise, which was otherwise um, uh, supported by two of the largest banks in the world um, and uh, was fully subscribed and looked set to, uh, to close in late December or, or early January, we obviously had to, to pause that. Okay. Uh, as, as it happens, in January, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the Buffen agreed to a plan that we proposed, which dealt with that immediate issue. Um, uh, and then the, the next event uh, was the, the failure of our insurer to, uh, to renew, which was in March. But, but if we go back to the pandemic, you, you seem to be saying, well, that there were problems in the capital markets, but that were, was for others to worry about, not so much Greensill at that point. Although there is a connection, isn't there, between the impact that it has on your clients and the stability of your, your own model of uh, business. Um, yeah. So, but are you saying back at, you know, when the pandemic first started and all these problems kicked off that you, you were really feeling pretty comfortable about Greensill's position? And that is, of course, coincident with when the lobbying really started from Mr. Cameron and yourself and others of the Treasury uh, to get involved in the CCFF fund and so on. But yeah. are you saying at that point there was no need to sort of dash for cash or, or, or to raise money? At, at that point, it was all pretty OK as far as you were concerned. As, as it turns out, it was completely OK, Mr. Chairman. But what we didn't know was what might happen in the future. Nobody knew what was going to happen next. Uh, and so we felt that it was prudent, given that Greensill was not regulated and therefore uh, didn't have central bank access, um, that the CCFF facility was something that would be of utility to those of our clients who are eligible in their own right to be able to access the facility, just as the Bank of England had allowed back in the 2009-10 financial crisis. So but the fact that you were therefore seeking that funding because you were concerned about the future, as I guess almost every business in the country would have been at that point, it does suggest that you had a need to go and raise that money to give you the comfort that you would ride out whatever was ahead, albeit that that was uh, uncertain in itself. Would that be a fair way of putting it? I, I think a correct characterization is we didn't know what was going to happen next. And we felt that having, for want of a better expression, a liquidity insurance policy, which the CCFF provided to many businesses uh, in, in the country, uh, who were making a material contribution to, to the uh, the country was a prudent thing for us as a business to do simply because nobody knew what was going to happen next. Okay so then the lobbying really starts doesn't it and we've obviously had uh, the letters uh, published today and I think you, you had access to those on a confidential basis a little while uh, ago so you've had time to digest them. Pretty intensive uh, lobbying particularly uh, from David Cameron um, can you just explain to the committee what kind of conversations you would have had with Mr. Cameron uh, around that lobbying in terms of why the funding was necessary, and particularly on this point, your point about what it was necessary because we had an uncertain future and we needed to get uh, some arrangements in place to cope with that and the potential commercial threat that that posed. Would you have discussed that with him? Certainly. So my discussions with Mr. Cameron uh, centred on the facility that had been in place during the financial crisis, how that facility worked, and the, um, the mooted um, CCFF facility, uh, as a, you would have noted in the, the letter that the governor of the Bank of England wrote to you, there had actually been comments uh, from uh, officers of the uh, of the Bank of England concerning the potential need for supply chain finance support from the central bank. Uh, so we talked about that. And we talked about the fact that there genuinely was uncertainty about what was happening in the capital markets. Um, and whilst I guess with the passing of time that we've, we've 
perhaps faded into the mists of uh, history, but if you remember at the time, it was, uh, it was an extraordinary time where liquidity was in very, very short supply. Um, and, uh, and so we were talking about what impact that could have on our supply chains. And that was also a concern to our customers, recognizing that we were financing millions of businesses and customers in over 150 countries around the world. Would it be fair to say that the reason given during the lobbying, uh, as far as we know it, um, for these approaches to the Treasury, the Bank of England, FCA, and so on, was that, that you were going to be helpful as a business to support SMEs uh, and supply chains and getting liquidity and finance out there, rather than any mention of the fact, as I think we've now established between us, that part of the reason for trying to raise this money was also to shore up against a potential problem in the future due to the pandemic and perhaps other factors? I think they're the same thing, Mr. Chairman. I, I think what our business was, was to deliver low cost, real time liquidity to small businesses, not only in Britain, but around the world. And that relied on proper functioning capital markets and they were not functioning properly in March and April 2020. But, but that's, that, that, that's a great story, and it may be a, a perfectly legitimate, valid story for the Treasury to motivate them to do as, as, as you were trying to have them do. But it is not one of the big motivations here, which you and David Cameron both appreciated, because you would have discussed these things, and you've discussed it with us now on this committee, that actually part of this push was to get cash into the business, because there would have been clear concern about the future of the business at that point, given what was happening in the capital markets as a consequence of the pandemic and other factors. Mr. Chairman, I think it's important that I make something very clear that Green Seal itself, and, and indeed as the Chancellor put in his letter that he wrote to you and the, and the Governor of the Bank of England, that Green Seal at no time sought funding for itself. Well, yes, but, but the, model, the model required, did it not, to sustain itself? It did need to have funding the, the model needed to keep going and having the funding come in would have kept the model going and it's the fact as you say that the insurance uh, were pulled that stopped the model working and then the whole thing fell apart our, our clients needed that continued liquidity as has always been the case and will always be the case into the future because these are real businesses in the real economy that are buying uh, goods on a uh, on a daily basis. Okay, all right. So, thank you, Lex, uh, for that. I'm going to go now to Felicity, please. Uh, good afternoon. I want to follow up on a few points that you've raised with regard to your business model. Now, you've talked about the importance of the credit insurance, and that is clear. Um, I understand that your insurers actually gave you notice on September the 1st to take effect on March the 1st. Um, if I were in your shoes, knowing the importance of credit insurance to your business, I would have been doing absolutely everything from September onwards, either to have your existing credit insurer, Tokyo Marine, sign up again or to find your replacement because this is the critical cog in the Credit Suisse Asset Management Fund. Did you do that? Ms. Buchan, we absolutely were confident in the fact that our insurances would be renewed. We did business with 28 insurers through our brokers, the, the largest insurance brokers in the world, Marsh, who manage those relationships for us. Um, and we worked intensively, not only with Tokyo Marine, but with all of our insurers, as we did every day, um, to make sure that we had the capacity to support our business. Um, it is a matter of fact that, in, that we had been working every week since that letter arrived to actually finalize uh, a renewal with Tokyo Marine 
and indeed one was drafted uh, between us and in an agreed form before the end of the year. And so um, the, the view that we had was that we would either renew with Tokyo Marine or we would renew with others, recognizing the number of other insurers that we worked with. And it's important also, if I, if I can remind the, uh, the committee, that for the credit insurance market, COVID was an extraordinarily frightening time when there was an expectation of very, very significant losses. Uh, indeed, many governments, including the British government, announced support arrangements for credit insurers to try and help and encourage them to continue to provide capacity uh, to, the, uh, to the markets. Um, and so actually, Tokyo Marine was not the only insurer to indicate that they would not renew, but in fact, the others did renew, driven largely by concerns about regulation. And if I may, Ms. Wacken, it, it strikes me that one of the key regulatory shortcomings shown by the failure of my firm, and to be clear, I take responsibility for the failure, but one of the key learnings is that the credit insurance regulation structure works in a counter-cyclical manner. That is, when the market turns down and the probability of defaults of businesses increase, in order for the solvency requirements of the insurer to be met, um, they must provide more capital because the probability of default of the businesses they've insured goes up in, in a crisis. And that is what happened during COVID. So what happened was many insurers needed either more capital to provide the same amount of cover, or they needed to cut cover in order to fit within the limited amount of capital that they had. And that seems to me to be yes. a crazy thing to, to, to okay. have. Okay, but let me take you to the verdict of the New South Wales Supreme Court. And they did not accept your lawsuit. They threw it out. And they said that they were given no evidence to show the talks took place to renew the insurance other than a letter dated February the 27th, 2021. And can I also ask you to react to that, but also as a supplementary, given how critical this credit insurance was, when did you tell Credit Suisse Asset Management that you did not think that you would be able to get credit insurance? So let me answer the second question first, if I may, Ms. Barkin. So, um, a number of our investors relied on insurance. They received information concerning the insurances that we held directly from our broker, Marsh, who actually arranged the insurances, not us. And, and that information was provided to our investors um, on a real-time basis, i.e. every time there was a change, they received an update. So in many cases, that meant they were being updated on a daily basis. So they knew the termination date uh, of, the, of the cover the same day that I knew about the termination date of the, uh, of the cover, because it was provided to me by the same mechanism that it is to, 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 to my investors. And the New South Wales Supreme Court, what's your reaction to them throwing out your lawsuit? Look, we made a difficult ask of the Supreme Court and we made the decision to do so on the weekend before our policy expired, we had expected, fully expected, that the policy would be renewed or extended. Um, and when we found out on Friday night, before it expired, that they would not be renewing, we had to very quickly put together an injunction where we sought an injunction to have the policy temporarily extended. Um, and I think the court felt that given the amount of money involved and the limited amount of time they had to consider the matter, um, that it was difficult for them to make that, that judgment in a very short period of time. But I, I can't speak for what was in the mind of the, of the court, but what I can I tell understand. you, Ms. Bucken, is that we were working day and night for basically every day from when we received that letter on the 1st of September 
to put the renewal in place with senior management, the okay. most... Let's move on, because I'm conscious I've got less than five minutes here, and there are a number of topics I want to address in terms of the business model. Now, you've talked about how you were lobbying Treasury in order to fund SMEs, but it seems to me that your business and the Gupta Group business had a huge amount of interdependence. Can you just tell the committee how much exposure you had to the Gupta Group and what percentage of your total exposure that was? Uh, and also with the reverse, how much of the Gupta Group funding did you provide? Uh, with the greatest respect, um, Ms. Duncan, um, I am not able to comment uh, about specific clients. I've received a, a directive from the administrator of Greensville Capital uh, specifically on that topic as she's undertaking uh, this and those matters are confidential. And indeed, as you published in your materials today, um, uh, there is a correspondence there from the FCA indicating that they are conducting their own inquiries. So I'm really not in a, in a position to comment specifically uh, on the, 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 uh, any particular client. But the German regulator has clearly raised concerns about your dependence on that particular client. Uh, and more correctly, their dependence on, on us. Yes, absolutely. Mutual but interdependence. I say, but I would say to you, Ms. Buchan, it is absolutely the case, as I said in my opening comments to uh, to, to your mm -hmm. chair, um, that we did have a concentration on certain mm -hmm. customers that was too high, yes. and I'm responsible for that. And that okay, let's move on in the interests of time, yes. Now, I want to take you up on the business model because it's short-term receivables repackaged with credit insurance until you come across this very bizarre concept of future receivables. Now, in my mind, there's no such thing as future receivables. You know, there's a prospect of doing business further out the line, but that's just the prospect. So if you're actually lending on this basis, this is simply unsecured lending. It's unsecured lending dressed up as receivables so that it can go into those funds. Ms. Buchan, you are quite correct that if we had not taken security and funded future receivables, it would be unsecured lending. But in no case did we provide a facility that supported future receivable financing that was not secured on real assets, as you say, like a loan would be. Um, and indeed, I put it to you that future receivables are widely used as a form of financing. Think about it, the largest pub groups in the UK finance themselves and their estate using future receivables. Um, most football stadiums. Yes, but can I interrupt? There's a big difference between having a history of cash flows and projecting forward. I understand here that companies have said that they've been asked about receivables and they have done no business with you. Uh, I also uh, see a quote from the German regulator, which says that they were unable to sorry, you were unable to provide evidence of the existence of receivables in your balance sheet that you had purchased from GFG Alliance Group. The, maybe I can address the, the, the German point uh, first and then the, uh, your, your first point second. So with respect to uh, our bank, we booked assets that were real assets. Uh, they were booked according to um, the advice and direction that we had from our auditors and from our legal advisors. And indeed, we're actually subject to a review by the Deposit Protection Regulator in Germany. Um, and we, we complied with that at, at all times. The BaFin indicated to us that they didn't agree with the classification of those assets. Um, and so after a discussion with them, we adjusted the classification of those assets, but at no time was there a position where the assets didn't exist. It was a question of classification. 
And so how did you classify them? We classified them as receivables and we booked them as exposures against um, the various customers uh, of uh, our clients. And we'd insured and bought insurance against the event that those receivables didn't come into uh, existence, plus took a comprehensive security package. Um, our regulator asked us to book that exposure as a single exposure against um, uh, that customer, in effect. So unsecured lending. In, in, in uh, yes. words, as, a, as effectively a loan. To yes, a precisely. Company. Unsecured lending. Yes. yes. So can um, I make the point it, it, in light of that, that it, it, that is not transparency here in your business model. The whole concept of future receivables is in effect a loan, unsecured lending, but it is being dressed up as supply chain finance. Ms. Buchan, every asset that we ever sold was correctly described and that information was prepared and made available to our investors, to our auditors and to our regulators and they had full and complete information at all times. So I, I don't accept your uh, your assertion. I'm being told I'm out of time, but just one very quick question. When you were lobbying a Treasury uh, to have supply chain finance approved, uh, were other competitors of yours lobbying in the same way? I, I can't speak for what other companies were doing, but I was aware that uh, my competitors um, also were concerned about market conditions and were interested uh, in the possibility uh, of central bank support, um, but I, I can't speak for them. I'm sure you'll ask them to, uh, to give you evidence. And what was your reaction when Treasury said no? It seems as though they made the right decision, but what was your reaction? Well, uh, my, my reaction is, uh, is seen from, from the actions that we took. Uh, I was very keen to see that the facility that the bank had put in place, the Bank of England had put in place during the financial crisis was able to be made available again. Um, but ultimately, as, as you rightly note, um, the Treasury and the Bank of England decided not to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Great. Thanks very much, Felicity. Rishanara, please. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Greensill, I've got a, a number of questions, so um, we'll try and rattle through as quickly as possible. Um, First, I have some questions about the lobbying process. Can you just talk me through what representations uh, you and David Cameron um, made on your behalf, your company's behalf, to the Chancellor or Treasury officials about Greensill's capital, Greensill Capital's application to the coronavirus large business interruption loan, the SIL bills loan, the design of that scheme, and the criteria for accreditation to the Silwell scheme, including um, uh, in the meeting that took place on the 24th of April, 2020, please. Ms. Ali, neither Mr. Cameron, to my knowledge, and certainly not I, uh, we did not make any representations to the, uh, with respect to the setup of the CL Bills program. And the only conversation I ever had with the Treasury on that topic was a conversation which I had with the second permanent secretary at the Treasury, where I informed him after the scheme had been put in place and it had been announced by the British Business Bank that we were now able to extend loans under that facility, that it would be helpful given the level of interest that we had seen if we would be able to have the higher uh, limit of 200 million instead of 50 million. Um, and the British Business Bank had informed us that that was a decision that only the Treasury could make. Hence, I raised it uh, with the second permanent secretary uh, and he subsequently wrote to me and said um, that uh, he would need to uh, see a request from the British Business Bank um, requesting him to do so. Uh, and as you would have seen in the correspondence from the Chancellor, no such request was ever forthcoming from the British Business Bank. So it's, it's really interesting because um... 27 days of dif uh, different days, Mr. Cameron lobbied government ministers and advisors, 56 emails and WhatsApps and counting I mean, I hope, uh, and other text messages. Um, and for those of us who, are, who understand how lobbying works, um, the reality is you got what you wanted in the end, didn't you, Mr. Greensill? 400 
million, that's my understanding from press reports of the seal bills um, loans to GFG linked companies provided by your company. So the lobbying did pay off, even if it, albeit through a different vehicle, through the British Business Bank and, um, you know, the, which is overseen by biz. You, you, did, you did actually get a positive outcome, right? Ms. Ali, as I say, I didn't have any discussion, and you'll have to ask Mr. Cameron whether he did, but I didn't have any discussion with any government official um, in the Treasury or the Bank of England concerning the CL bills facility or our eligibility for it um, until after the British Business Bank um, had determined that we were eligible right. and, and announced it publicly. Right. Uh, so, and, and Biz, did, did anyone have any links with the business department? Okay. So can you, can you just confirm the press reports that Green Seal loaned a total of 400 million in the Seal Bills GFG linked companies, and it was split out across eight loans of 50 million. Uh, and could you, could you just confirm that? No, I'm, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I'm afraid I'm not permitted to, um, to make any customer specific. This is about the past, and we're here to talk about the past and what your involvement. You've come, you've arrived in this committee, you've apologized for the 1,000 jobs uh, lost in your own company and, and others related. I think you owe it to the British people to answer the question, Mr. Greensill. I, I, I'm afraid, as I explained to uh, your, uh, your chair before I spoke, um, I've had very clear instruction from the administrator of Greensill um, and indeed from my legal advisors, and you will have noted the letter from the FCA, uh, I'm simply not able to comment about specific customers, but I, I will help you in any way I can with your inquiries. No, I think that people will infer from your inability or reluctance to come clean and be transparent on this committee, on this parliamentary committee, which you claim to have respect for, that actually, given the 50 million cap, it was, you know, there was, there was, there, the, that it, that actually what you were doing was you were deliberately restructuring in order to take advantage and you were actually doing something that was beyond the scope of what should have happened. That there was something improper went on here, which exactly. led to 100 million of loans being provided. Exactly. Greensill Capital was selected by the British Business Bank as being eligible to operate the scheme. Um, the credit that we extended to our customers complied with our ordinary credit rules and procedures, which were scrutinized by the British Business Bank. Each facility that we provided was reviewed by a top tier London law firm. And where there was any question about the interpretation of the British Business Bank rules, we actually had that leading law firm directly discuss the matter with the British Business Bank in order to ensure that it did comply with the rules. So it is my opinion that every facility that we provided complied with the British Business Bank rules. Interesting. Um, and can you just talk me through how many other CLBILS loans Greensill made? Um, or did you only uh, loan to GFG linked companies? Um, we provided facilities to other customers um, under the British Business Bank facilities. So okay. not okay. only to any to a sort of the, a single group, for example. And how many of them would you be able to say? I wouldn't be able to say. Right. It, 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 and is that because, again, because of the, the point you made earlier? That's right. I, I'm not permitted to talk to you about customer confidential information. We're, we're, okay. we're, we're a financial institution. I'm, it's simply not something that I can discuss uh, in, a, in an open forum, our, our clients' confidential information. So, so just going back to the Lord Miners um, evidence session, and, and obviously you've addressed some points that the chair has raised. Um, Lord Miners talked about the cost of, um, told this committee that the total cost 
to the taxpayer from the green seal scandal would amount to three to five billion pounds, including one billion in direct costs. Uh, and as you've heard the chair, um, he quoted, he was quoted in, in our committee as saying, I left the meeting traveling down in the lift thinking of myself, this has many elements of the Ponzi, of a Ponzi scheme. You are, you have come into this committee today and you have discredited his evidence. You've tried to discredit his evidence. Um, who should we believe, Lord Miners or you? Who's lying? Who's telling, who's not telling us the truth here in this committee? The public deserve to know the truth, Mr. Greensill. Certainly, Ms. Ali, I have told the committee the truth today. So are you saying Lord Miners lied to this committee? Ms. Ali, I, I'm telling you what I have told you is the truth and it is supported by written evidence. Right. So Lord Miners is not telling the truth in you are. Is that what you're saying? What I've said is I've given a, a correct account based on my knowledge and recollection and written evidence. And I mean, the, the, the point is you've admitted to the failure and the cost yourself in jobs and the associated losses to other companies. I have. Lord Miners has talked about the amount, one billion pound direct costs, and it's in other, in other reference by others as well, right? And 3.5 billion indirect. What do you have to say to that? Is he lying about that in your opinion? Or is he telling the truth? And, and is everybody else, I mean, it seems like you're gaslighting here. You know, you've, you've blamed the insurance company. You're blaming Lord Miners. But the person, the company that has cost the taxpayer money is your company and it's you. I don't recognize or know how Lord Miners came up with the numbers that he shared with this committee two weeks ago. And I haven't seen him publish a breakdown of how he arrived at that. I certainly have noted that others have quoted Lord Miners since then, but I haven't seen how he arrived at that number. But if, perhaps if we pause and, and let's see if we can work the number out together. One billion was right. not just Lord Miners. That number has been in the public domain a very long time. So what, how, how would you calculate it? What has been the loss to the taxpayer? There has been no loss to the taxpayer, Ms. Ali. There has been no loss. Yes. So once again, Lord Miners is not telling the truth, is not giving the correct facts. Others who have given evidence are not giving the correct facts, but you are. You, we are expected to believe there's no loss and you are telling the truth here. The total amount of, we've, we've, just, we've just been talking about the CL bills facilities. So the total quantum of CL bills facilities that Greensville Capital extended was 400 million pounds. The total amount of C bills facilities that we extended was 18.5 million pounds. C, C bills and CL bills facilities are guaranteed to the extent of 80% of the amount of the loan. The knock on effect on a company, on the seal company, and the knock on effect in terms of jobs and consequences will amount to a greater deal of expense to the taxpayer. Ms. Ali, you asked me how the, the calculation around the billion direct cost was calculated. What I'm trying to do is help you to get to the fact, the facts here. So the total amount of guarantees yeah. that, that uh, from the British Business Bank the guaranteed amount is £334,800,000. Interesting. So but not, indirect, no. we're talking about direct and indirect costs. Can I, can I just, I'm going to move well, on to, to, the speak to the in relation to, in, in relation to, and you may, once again, you may not answer this question, but I hope you will. Can you just talk us through when you started working with Mr. Gupta and his company and, and when your company started doing that? Is that allowed? Are you allowed to answer that question? Um, I think some of that is actually in the public domain. So I'm prepared to comment on uh, the parts that are in the public domain, Ms. Ali, as I'm genuinely trying to be helpful to you. Um, I believe that I met Mr. Gupta Back in 2015, I was actually introduced to him uh, by an executive at Eula Hermes, who's one of the largest insurance companies in the world. Um, we did a very small amount of business with Mr. Gupta uh, initially, um, and that over time increased. That, that over time, that, that increased? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna... 
Uh, I, I just have one more question in relation to insurance. You talked about the insurance company earlier about the insurance um, facility not being, uh, you know, one of the reasons for the collapse of Greensill. Um, can you just can you just explain how you come to that conclusion? Uh, furthermore, you know, a bit more about how you come to the conclusion that your company um, why, why should the public believe that that's the reason why your company collapsed, rather than the points that Felicity uh, raised about the business model that your company used? Well, I, Felicity has her, um, her her own opinion, but uh, you've asked me my opinion. Uh, what we've done is we have taken cash flows, which we collect from the um, accounting systems of our clients in real time and made that information available to investors so that they are able to invest in the real economy in a way that hadn't ever been able to be done by anybody other than banks before. And we, through doing that, we've been able to provide finance to millions of businesses in over 150 countries. And those people did not do business with me, Ms. Ali, because of our brand or because of our marketing expense. They did business with us for one reason and one reason only, and that is they got a better deal from us than they could get from their banks. And so actually what I would say is to those millions of businesses and employees who made use of our technology, they voted with their feet. It is absolutely correct. We ultimately failed, Ms. Ali. So there clearly was a flaw in our business. But the fundamental truth is taking real-time information out of corporate accounting systems and making using that information to make credit decisions and make lower cost credit available completely electronic, electronically to small businesses and consumers around the world absolutely is the future. But the way that I did it definitely okay. has flaws. So and the insurance value. Sorry, running, running out of time. But you, what your conduct, your company's conduct is hardly an advertisement for that kind of credit. Uh, and small businesses to, to small businesses. And in fact, what we've seen is a concentration of risk. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, unsecure, unsecured loans uh, uh, in effect have been provided and you haven't helped businesses. You've actually damaged the reputation of legitimate supply chain finances. And to conclude, in fact, in fact, Miners has a point, doesn't he? It is, it is a Ponzi scheme. It is, frankly, it smacks of fraudulent behavior and it franks of the sort of stuff we saw conducted by the likes of, the likes of Madoff in the financial crisis. That's what it smacks of. It doesn't smack of a proper process where people can get supply chain finance that is reliable and credible. Zali, when I started Greensill, no member of this committee, or indeed I think almost any institution had heard of supply chain finance. Now, every major financial institution in the world offers it as a product, rather like a checking account to a corporate. That has meant that tens of millions of businesses have benefited from that. Yeah, though, Mr. Greensill, isn't the problem here? It's not about innovation around a particular way to finance. Isn't the problem here that you and David Cameron, who pushed for this while you were an advisor in government, and then you and David Cameron stood to benefit from that process. The idea might have been a good one, but there is a clear conflict of interest here. You didn't do, you know, your idea might have been valuable to the world of finance, but what you created ultimately and the conduct of lobbying in the way that ha that had happened using a former prime minister, frankly, bringing that position into disrepute to benefit, to profit, is where the problem lies and going so far that actually many would argue you and Mr. Cameron lost sight, was what, uh, lost sight of what 
the right what was appropriate behavior and appropriate action in terms of providing supply chain finance is ali the beneficiaries of green sill and the business model that we developed which is now being copied by thousands of financial institutions around the world has not been a great boon to financial institutions the reason it has has grown as it has is because it's helped tens of millions of businesses. That's not, the, that's not the point here. The point is, and, and many of our experts who gave, the experts who gave evidence recently talked about where the positives are to supply chain finance. The question is whether what you created and what you were selling was actually proper supply chain finance or a Ponzi scheme. And I, I, can, I, I, I state to you that your scheme was something quite different from a proper appropriate supply chain finance process that protects the public interest and in fact what your company did is lose taxpayer uh, billions potentially but indirectly and certainly uh, a few hundred million up to a billion of public money i'm going to stop there because i know others have other questions thank you right i think it's probably only fair lex if you did have anything to say to that to say it you may not do in which case you're his day that's fine um i will go on to siobhan please thank you Mr. Greensill, are you a fraudster? No, Ms. McDonough, I am not. Okay, because I'm a lay person and I've looked up the definition of fraud. It's an act or an instance of deception, an artifice by which the right or interest of another is injured, a dishonest trick. Again, as a lay person, it seems to me that this is precisely what your financial model of prospective receivables is nothing more than a trick lending against transactions that have never happened may never happen and with companies that don't even know they're involved in the transaction and then selling it on as a low risk bond it's pretend it's an imagined imaginary thing so how is that not fraud Ms. mcdonough the business that we undertook was properly described, all of our investors understood exactly what it was that they were purchasing. In any investment, there is risk. But what we did is we took the history and the current activity of our clients. That history and data enabled us to see what was going to happen in the future and allow businesses to be able to access credit. We didn't just do that for the private sector. We also did it for the public sector. And indeed, it was done by the public sector here in Britain before Greensill Capital was even funding uh, government related supply chains. So no, I don't accept uh, your statement. Um, but I do recognise that any financial asset comes with risk. And because we considered that our reputation would be harmed if our investors were to ever lose money, we spent tens of millions of pounds every year purchasing insurance to protect against an event where there was a loss that arose and we took significant security packages to support that uh, position. So um, we felt and I continue to believe that the business that we undertook was a business that helped the broader economy and frankly is in line with the forms of financing that have been conducted here in for periods of time long before Greensill Capital even started as a firm. I gave the example of pubs here in Britain. How much were you paying for your insurance? You were paying 1% on unsecured loans, which were a risk of over 10%. How did you believe that the insurance you were paying actually met the risk? So where the goods had been delivered and approved, um, we did extend unsecured credit. Um, and in the history of our firm, there was a failure. Uh, one that was in the press was a British listed company, NMC Healthcare. Our, it, it had supply chain programs provided to it by 
half a dozen banks, I believe, of which our institution was one. And our institution was the only one, to my knowledge, that was able to, through our technology systems and processes, to correctly identify fraudulent or potentially fraudulent transactions and exclude them. Whereas my understanding is other financial institutions did fund those, that company ultimately went into bankruptcy. In the papers, Mr. Greensill, in the papers signed by you uh, to the administrators, you say that step one in your business was the customer, and I quote, the customer obligor is issued an invoice by the supplier in the normal course of business. However, this only happened about half the time and most of your revenue related to times when no invoice was involved. Isn't this description deceptive? Our business was all about financing receivables and future receivables. But no other business does future receivables. They at least expect that there's an inventory. In half of your cases, there was no inventory and there was no invoice. There was no evidence of any activity or business whatsoever. The condition of our facilities, uh, Ms. McDonough, is that um, they must do business with the customer. They must have the history to support that um, and the data to support that. And we take a secured interest um, where it is um, a future receivable, so where the goods have not yet been delivered. Um, and indeed, to protect our investors, we purchased insurance to ensure that in the event that there was an issue of any description, including fraud, um, the insurance would be effective. And if I can come back to my NMC Health example, our investors there, even though that company actually did apparently or allegedly um, commit fraud and we excluded the fraudulent uh, transactions, our investors were paid under our insurance policies. So they it's, were protected. Mr. That's Greenstone, why we spent the money on for that. Clarity, for clarity, I'm not accusing anybody of fraud other than yourself. In 50% of cases, there was no inventory, there was no invoice, and the insurance that you paid cost substantially less than the risk you held. You have much more experience and knowledge than me. You knew that that insurance would never cost the risk that you was actually wrapped up in your business. I, I disagree with your assessment, uh, Ms. McDonough. Yeah. In the company's house submission, you describe Greensill as a supply chain finance company, but this represents only 10% of your business, as I think Felicity has already said, with 90% representing unsecured loans to high risk borrowers. Are you trying to deceive creditors about your company's true business model? No, I'm not deceiving investors around the business model of, uh, of our company. We never have. And we went to great lengths to make sure that not only did our investors have full information about what they invested in, um, but indeed that, in fact, we also, in many cases, provided insurance to protect against the event that actually there was a default and that insurance had been proven in many instances over the years to be effective and to protect the investors. The, the, uh, the government's coronavirus support programs were introduced at the same time as you were trying to reduce your exposure to GFG Alliance. Mr. Greensill, was it your intention to shift as much of that exposure onto the government books and ultimately the British taxpayer using a for pri former prime minister to aid your case? Ms. McDonough, I am not able to comment on specific clients, as I mentioned earlier. And earlier in your evidence, you suggested that the public sector didn't lose out from your dealings. Uh, but in the list of creditors uh, that, you, that you submitted from your firm includes Islington Council, only a few miles uh, from Westminster, 
which is currently owed £100,000 by, by your firm, don't you think you should pay them back? We owe, uh, with respect to council tax on the offices that, uh, that we have in, uh, in central London, and that's where that, uh, that arises. And I'm extremely sorry that, uh, that that's occurred. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, uh, Javon. I'm going to go to Angela, please. Thank you. And I want uh, Mr. Greensill to talk about this concept of prospective receivables um, rather than future receivables, which seems to be even more um, detached from actual business that is going on and be almost entirely speculative. How much of your business actually that you wrote actually was prospective receivables then angela the percentage of our business that was prospective in, in receivables was zero i've never heard of the concept i read about it in the financial times if you were to look at the documentation relating to any of our facilities you would never see those words appear so, so you weren't question, just, to, just to make just to make absolutely certain um that i've got you correctly here mr greensill you, you're saying that you never um, financed a deal uh, for any uh, invoicing, uh, supply chain invoicing that hadn't actually happened, but might be in some future period expected to happen. In other words, a future receivable or a prospective receivable. But we, we did provide facilities with respect to future receivables. Um, I'm not familiar with your description of a prospective receivable, um, but as I was explaining uh, to the uh, um, previous member, um, we provided secured facilities, not unsecured facilities, um, that uh, covered future receivables. Um, the only exception, in fact, to that, um, Dame Angela, is uh, in the case of Her Majesty's Government, and the NHS pharmacy early payment scheme that we funded, those were future receivables. And there, we did not take security. That program has been running since 2013. We took over together with Talia funding that in 2018. And that program, which is funding future receivables, allowed pharmacists to reduce their cost of capital according to the PwC cost of service inquiry, which was undertaken in 2011. It enabled the reduction of the cost of capital that was paid to pharmacies. So at taxpayer expense, pharmacies were reimbursed for their cost of capital, which was previously 12.3%. That was the average was 12.3%. In fact, for small pharmacies, it was over 17% that was being reimbursed. Um, Mr. Greensill, that, that, I, 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 that, I think- that's, All of that cost was removed. I think that there and, are going to be some questions- the cost became much lower. I think there are going to be some questions about that um, in, uh, subsequently, but I know that you, you said originally that you'd never heard of the concept of future receive, prospective receivables. You I said prospective receivables is not now, a concept in any of our documents. Uh, let's get back rather than uh, worry about a phrase. Let me rephrase the original question then. How much of your business was actually future receivables? Uh, of our total flow, so last year we funded uh, 143 billion US dollars worth of receivables um, and the future receivable component of that, uh, I don't know the exact percentage off the top of my head. I will provide that to you as a written answer uh, post this, um, but it would have been less than 20% of our activity of the receivables. Okay. That, that would be very helpful. And, and, and perhaps in that letter, you'd also let us know whether that percentage had gone up over time as, as your business approached its final uh, denouement, which obviously nobody knew about. That, that would also be helpful. So I can get perhaps, a sense of whether it's could, becoming more so um, reliant. Perhaps I could provide. Perhaps I could provide you the 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020 numbers so that you're able to see that, Dame Angela. That would be very helpful. Now, the other issue about this particular um, future receivables um, concept 
uh, that's worried me while I've been looking at this is that uh, the FT has published clear evidence of invoices referring to firms which now say they never traded uh, with Gupta or GFG Alliance or, or you, and yet you seem to have securitized some of those invoices. So that rather hints that there's some fraud somewhere, doesn't it? Dame Angela, as you'd appreciate, I'm not able to comment on specific clients and certainly um, uh, ones where there's the possibility of uh, an investigation into that. Um, what I can tell you, of course, uh, is that at no point would we or my firm um, have uh, engaged in financing uh, receivables which we uh, knew to be fraudulent. Of course not, but uh, what due diligence did you do, especially in those groups that, if, if I could say, uh, you were you were sort of had a symbiotic relationship with, such as GFG? It's worth noting, um, Dame Angela, that GFG was not our biggest customer. Um, we had bigger customers than, than GFG that we provided more funding to. Um, and in all of our clients, the core of our business was accessing directly and generally in real time their accounting systems to, to extract from them both current and historical trading information to enable us to make informed and real-time credit decisions around our ability to support the supply chains in which uh, in which they yeah. operate. No, and I understand um, that it's possible to do that by going into systems if the trade has actually happened and the invoices exist because there's actually been a transfer. But if we're talking about prospective receivables, how did you check that there was no fraud there? Because it just seems so so convenient that you can you can um, package up and securitize something that uh, one of your clients says has happened uh, with a with a future flow of of uh, payments attached so that you can then sell that as an asset when in fact it looks like the situation has arisen that uh, these were all fictional uh, and so what you are actually selling into the Credit Suisse bonds and, and marketing to investors were, were things that were just unsecured lending and wishful thinking. Well, Angela, as I said before, um, with the exception of our UK government future receivable programme, the other future receivable programmes were secured, not unsecured, um, and benefited from insurance. But let's use the UK government future receivable program to answer your question. So there, no, I, I what, we, what about, we did I, is I don't, we, want to talk, I don't want to talk about the UK government future receivable program. I want to talk about these securitized investments that you sold into um, credit well, we, fees. How and we did, did you check we did that? that these things had actually happened and they weren't just the figment of somebody's imagination in, in say, the Gupta industries? So we securitized uh, the UK government future receivable assets, just as we did the others. And uh, what we did is we took real time and historical information, which we used in order to make projections as to what would happen in the future. And if we were to use the pharmacy example here in the UK, for many years, that operated where we built an algorithm together with the Department of Health that predicted what the value would be of each prescription that was filled here in the UK and ultimately even predicted how many prescriptions would be filled in each pharmacy here in the UK. And that program, because we were able to provide that financing ultimately at less than 1% per annum, compared with the weighted average cost before that PwC determined and the government was reimbursing of 11.3% per annum, that saved the taxpayer 100 million pounds or more than 100 million pounds every year. Well, that is the saving that comes from using technology, capturing information, historical and expected future activity from accounting systems of clients, it saved the taxpayer 
over 100 million pounds a year. Mr. Greensill, I'm, I'm talking about what's uh, gone wrong and why your company collapsed and why mm -hmm. there are now huge amounts of losses, um, not least to those that invested in the Credit Suisse bonds. I'm, I'm just going to ask you again, what kind of due diligence was done when you securitized these, these uh, prospective receivables from the GFG group? Because it looks increasingly, uh, and you don't have to comment on this, but it looks increasingly like the, the case that uh, you were securitizing invoices that didn't really exist on flows of money that weren't due. Now that you know, um, has meant that the Credit Suisse investors have lost large amounts of money, that lots and lots of people have lost large amounts of money uh, because they've invested in bonds and, and, and assets, so-called assets, which you created and securitized, uh, which were actually unsecured and high risk, not low risk, as they were marketed by you. So we did... Uh... The diligence that we conducted was all outlined in the security documentation that investors purchased. They did so with full knowledge. We did it based on the data that we collected from our clients. Um, but they made a decision, just as we did um, in when we purchased those assets as a principle for ourselves, that we trusted those clients and that the data that we were collecting and the verification that supported that was sufficient. Um, it may well be the case that we learn lessons that say that more should have been done by us, um, but that's uh, something for the future. But I would emphasize to you that so far, no one has made a loss. That is the reason we purchased insurance to protect investors against that potential catastrophic event. But are you saying that the insurance is the security rather than the physical assets that you're meant to be selling? Not at all. Um, wherever, as I said before, Dame Angela, and I'm afraid you've contradicted me on a number of occasions, but I'll correct you one more time. Um, where we did future receivable programs, other than for the British government, to my knowledge, all of them were secured against real assets to support those facilities. Can you tell me how you can finance at 1% and pay insurance premia and all of the other costs that go with securitization? Uh, sorry, you've said that we financed at 1%. I presume you're referring to the UK government supply chain program that I was referring to? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the margins, we, we actually charged a lot less than 1% in the case of the, uh, the UK program. Uh, and it's the, the insurance that we pay is based on the probability of default of our customers. The probability that the National Health Service is going to default is quite remote. So the cost of that insurance is quite low and our investors are prepared to buy that asset at a level that reflects that, uh, uh, that risk. Um, but it is true, we made a very modest uh, revenue on providing the solutions that we did to the British government. Indeed, in aggregate, we made a loss um, providing these solutions uh, to, the, uh, to the British government. But the beneficiary of that was the taxpayer in the savings of over 100 million pounds a year and of the many businesses that supplied the, uh, the National Health Service who were able to access credit at less than 1% per annum. Now, the person that um, wrote your insurance for Tokyo Marine was dismissed for um, writing too much insurance and taking too much risk. Um, what, and, 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 isn't that what caused your business to collapse in the end? I can't comment on um, an employee relationship with, uh, within uh, an insurance company. Um, but uh, what I can say, and I did say at the outset, uh, is that we had uh, an over-reliance on insurance generally, and we purchased too much of our insurance from one particular insurer, even though we did buy cover from 28 different insurers, we did too much of our business with one insurer, Dame Angela, and that's definitely a learning and I take responsibility for that. And what kind of um, uh, security did you have on some of these securitized 
assets that you sold into Credit Suisse? Because I've read in various places that although these are meant to be short term assets, that you back them up with very, very long term illiquid um, security buildings right. and things right. like that. Correct. So we were financing the working capital of the business, but in the event that there was a default, we had security and the strongest form of security is absolutely to take security over bricks and mortar um, and inventory, uh, uh, receivables uh, and other assets of, uh, of a business. Uh, just one final question, and that is uh, Gupta was actually, uh, was he on your board or he had some shares in the company at some stage? What was going on there? Uh, Mr. Gupta was never on the board of, uh, of my company. He have shares? Um, Yes, uh, there was a very short period of time where we at that time were doing a small amount of business uh, with him. Uh, he bought uh, a small stake in our firm uh, and then subsequently we decided to do significantly more business with him and my board and I judged that it wasn't appropriate to be having him as a shareholder and provide more than a de minimis amount of facilities to him uh, and so he sold those shares completely um, and those transactions were affected uh, within a couple of months of him becoming a shareholder and then uh, and then selling out and he uh, did not make a profit uh, on that sale he sold the shares for the same price that he purchased them and did you do the same thing with softbank given that softbank also um, financed uh, greensill and then um, seemed to have borrowed extensively from the credit swiss so none of our, the, the two large institutional shareholders that uh, we have um, borrowed money from Greensville Capital. I think what you might be referring to, Dame Angela, uh, is that um, um, our, we provided facilities to companies in which uh, SoftBank Vision Fund the Vision. was a minority, was a minority equity investor in other companies and we provided certain facilities to those other companies. That's correct. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Uh, to Alison, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Greensill, in the 2019 annual report for Greensill Capital, it lists concentration on certain customers, key employees and suppliers as one of your key risks. Can you tell us, um, did you feel you were carrying a concentration risk uh, at any point? I, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. Would you mind just saying that question again, please? Sure. In Greensill Capital's 2019 uh, annual report, it lists concentration on certain customers, key employees and suppliers as one of the key risks um, in the annual report. Yes. Given all that's, um, that has occurred since then, did you feel at that point you were carrying a concentration risk or at any point before or after? Our annual report is accurate. And uh, it is the case that in, in a small company, when you start your first company, the first customer you do business with by definition is a big concentration risk. The first partner that you have who provides you with services is a big concentration risk. Um, when Greensville Capital failed, we were a little over nine years old. And so as we grew, it is absolutely the case that we had concentrations that were unacceptably high and we worked hard to bring those down. Um, but as I said in my opening remarks, it is the case that concentrations we had both on insurance and clients were too high um, and were uh, the principal contributing factor to the failure of my company, which is to my very significant regret. And in identifying those risks and appreciating those risks, which you clearly did, what action did you take? Uh, we built a very material risk function compliance function um, and, uh, and also um, continued to build out our legal function. Um, we changed the way our risk approval processes worked. So we created a separate credit committee. I was removed from uh, the credit and risk approval processes of the, uh, of the firm, um, such that uh, any members of our board um, were unable to participate in the, uh, the risk approval processes. Um, additionally, we as we grew, we aimed to further diversify our, our business, which we did do, um, but clearly not enough when COVID comes along and 
you know, significantly disrupts um, the insurance world and indeed that of a number of our clients. And at what point did you, did those alarm bells start ringing for you that perhaps your survival had become, become too linked to any one of your customers and that there was too much risk in one place? Certainly. Uh, it was apparent that that was the case in December last year when the Barfin wrote to us and proposed a reduction plan that was unachievable for us to do. And um, potentially, had they implemented it, and to be clear, they did not order us to make that reduction plan, they proposed it to us. But had they implemented it, that would have likely been catastrophic. As it turns out, um, they ultimately agreed a different plan with us, which we were able to, to work to and we expected to be able to meet. Um, so it was clear to me um, in December last year that that concentration was um, potentially a risk to, to the entire firm. Um, but we had been working diligently to reduce our exposure prior to that date. So it kind of come as a huge surprise to you? Uh, as in, in December, is that what you mean? Yes. yes. If they're it, coming to you with this decision, that can't have come out of the blue entirely then, surely? Uh, so certainly it did come out of the blue in the sense that we actually um, had agreed to and basically been following a concentration reduction plan up to that point, um, but the Buffon then proposed, or rather suggested that they were going to propose um, a, a much more onerous uh, reduction plan, which we would not have been able to comply with and would have um, potentially uh, put, the, uh, put our firm at risk. But I want to emphasize, okay. they ultimately did not implement that plan, um, but out of transparency and completeness to the committee, I wanted to be, to, be, to be open with you about the fact that that was the point at which I became concerned. And it was that point that then triggered um, us bringing in restructuring advisors to advise us at the end of December, on the 31st of December last year, um, we appointed advisors to assist us um, around um, managing that risk and making sure that we were going to be able to, uh, uh, to um, um, carry on and serving all of our customers. Okay. I mean, it seems a bit odd to me, given how you described to um Ms. Madonna, the kind of crystal ball-like qualities you had within your business for predicting uh, what was going to happen in different businesses that you didn't see this gaping big hole in your own. With the benefit of hindsight, it seems that you are right. Okay. You talked about um, in one of the answers about your, your business model being copied by other organisations around the world. Given what's unfolded here, should that worry us? I think uh, as, as I... Uh, mentioned when I was addressing your chair, um, I think that one of the real lessons from the failure of my firm and the impact that it's had on, you know, the 1,200 employees that uh, that we had, um, is that a heavy reliance on trade credit insurance uh, is dangerous, and I would urge you and the committee to consider the manner in which that is regulated, because it is fundamentally countercyclical in its behaviour, and there is a long list of uh, companies, not financial institutions like mine, but there is a long list of companies here in the UK that have been put out of business um, by credit insurers making uh, changes which are driven by um, uh, the, the turn of the economy, um, which of course is what happened um, when, when uh, COVID broke out earlier this year, oh, sorry, uh, last year, and, and obviously had an unprecedented impact on, uh, on, on our economy. You talk, we've talked a bit about the, the kind of exposure and having a, one kind of big company, um, one customer rather, um, which is quite big compared to the others that you had. What's the kind of balance that there was on that? Um, and was, this, was the service that you're providing to that, that one large customer different to any, the way you were treating your other clients? Sure. I, I want to emphasize that the customer that you all think is my largest customer was not. Um, Who was I'm not allowed to say, but the, the British company that you keep talking about was not our largest customer in terms of the assets that we funded. So the error that we made uh, and the importance in the business model was to have a diversity of capital available to support every one of our customers. Um, and we had too concentrated a mechanism of funding for some of those larger customers. Um, so in fact, our largest customer had a very diverse committed funding 
from banks to support it was very, very stable. That is what we should have done more generally across our business. Um, but there were a handful of customers um, where we were much more reliant on credit insurance um, and fewer investors. And that created a concentration risk, which ultimately undid the dream that an awful lot of people had um, and the good that we, we had done around the world. If you were to put a percentage, perhaps, on the amount of your business that went through these large companies compared to your smaller clients, what would that be? Uh, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to have to rephrase your question to, to, to accurately answer it. So if you think about um, our clients, they have thousands of customers and suppliers. So essentially, the party that we contract with tends to be the pinch point in between the purchases of uh, goods and services and the sale of, of, of those on, on to others. Um, and so in terms of those pinch point customers, uh, we had um, between two and 300 of those customers in total. Um, in terms of the kind of suppliers and the, uh, the customers uh, to, uh, and, and the consumers that supported those businesses on both sides, that amounted to more than 10 million. Okay. And I wanted to ask a wee bit more um, about the, the issue you mentioned about insurers. And um, you mentioned, I think, a one large insurer and I think 28 smaller ones. Is that the figure that you'd said? It was, it was 28 in total. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and one of those disproportionately larger. And again, yes. could you give us a bit more of a description of, of what that looks like? Um, yes. How that breaks uh, down? I'm very reluctant to, to mislead you and the committee. So could I ask to provide in writing to you afterwards um, what the actual breakdown was so that I don't kind of accidentally mislead you, but uh, um, it, it was a, a material double digit percentage um, with respect to, uh, to Tokyo Marine. Okay, because I think it would be useful for us to understand um, exactly what these risks looked like to the company, exactly what the weighting is um, on where these things lie. Um, so we can get a better idea of just how much risk there was um, in particular areas, um, because obviously this has gone badly wrong. This is a complete mess. The house of cards has, has fallen yes. to the ground um, and taking a lot of other things with it. So I think understanding the balance of where those risks were um, would be quite useful for us um, as well. Uh, and lastly, I was, I was curious, just on another point that you'd made about a, the assets you were securing against, and if you could give any examples of what perhaps those physical assets were. Yes, so those, as, as I mentioned, uh, um, when, when answering, answering um, Dame Angela's questions, uh, those assets um, ranged from uh, real estate uh, to um, uh, vehicles, to inventory, uh, receivables, intellectual property, um, uh, um, kind of credits and licenses of, uh, of, of various natures, cash, um, and indeed, uh, personal guarantees in some cases uh, of uh, of principles of, um, of of the business, and often case a uh, security over the actual shares themselves in the companies that uh, that we provided these facilities to. Okay, thank you. I think that's all the questions I had here. Thank you. Thank you, Alison and Steve, please. Thank you, Chair. I refer to my registered shareholding in GlintPay, and I do so because I'm going to ask you about Greensill as a fintech business. Now, Mr. Greensill, I can't help noticing that in the midst of what must be a personal disaster for you, for former prime minister, for the employees you had and, and, and everybody else involved, in the midst of this disaster, if I may say so, your face seemed to light up a little as you started to explain that the kind of business you were conducting was the future and that others are following your suit. And I wanted to just give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit about that. What was it that was the new thing that you were doing and how did that make you a fintech business? Certainly. So the business that, uh, that we undertook recognised that the extension of credit to um, small businesses in particular, but also to consumers in the economy, is largely predicated on information that is, and, and when I started the, the firm, or indeed actually when I started working in supply chain finance in the, uh, in the, in the mid uh, decade of, the, of the, the start of the 2000s, uh, 
that information was trapped inside the accounting ledgers of businesses and governments. Had that information been made available on a real-time basis to banks or to financial investors, that would enable credit to be extended both electronically and much more cheaply because the risk was less. It's just that um, banks simply didn't know what was tied up inside a, a company's records. For example, the fact that they knew they were going to purchase some goods in the future or that they'd already received those goods and they were going to pay for them at some point or that an employee had already worked a certain number of hours and therefore was already owed a certain amount of money. By taking that information out of corporates and governments and making that available to the financial sector, we were able to reduce the frictional costs of delivering capital to, uh, to other people. And, and uh, to do that, I, I did note um, in your committee a couple of weeks ago, um, I think we were sort of somewhat described as Luddites. Um, I suspect that the more than 600 people who worked in my business in technology and support functions, a great many of them here in the Northwest of England, um, would have been um, pretty shell-shocked to have heard that. But frankly, it would be impossible to do that at the scale that we were doing it. You know, we were extending credit on an average day in the order of half a billion dollars it simply would not be possible to do that <laughs> kind of with pens and paper. Um, it had to be based on uh, on technology, Mr. Barker. It's Baker, but don't worry about it. But I, mean, this is... I apologize, sir. That's <laughs> no, all right. Don't worry about it. It's not the end of the world in all the circumstances. So the point is you're using technology to get inside people's accounting ledgers to understand what's going on and to reduce the, the, the cost of providing credit. And I think you've articulated that really well. You mentioned employees and their wages. I think that's this app called Earned. Is that right? Yes, sir. And is that still in, in business? I'm afraid I haven't quite caught up. That uh, um, Earned was uh, was sold. Um, uh, and uh, and was was purchased um, by uh, by Wagestream, which is a British company. Yeah. Um, but uh, to be clear, that service was offered um, before uh, my business entered this space. Um, however, the difference was uh, that that service um, had a, a, a unit charge uh, to it, typically a, a charge of a, a pound or two for the employee to be able to access their pay early. Because we were already integrated to the accounting systems of many um, kind of uh, private sector and indeed um, some public sector entities, um, we were able to easily use that information to effectively allow employees to get access to the same thing. Um, and so uh, we were happy to provide that service at no charge to, to employees, largely because it was using the existing infrastructure that we had built recognizing we made you know millions of payments um, okay. and we already had that infrastructure so tell tell us a bit about that infrastructure to what extent was it proprietary to, to what extent did it use ai machine learning all those good things certainly uh, so like uh, um, all businesses we invested heavily um, in continuing to uh, to grow our technology so it would be fair to say that when we started the business in 2011 the technology of our business was largely excel spreadsheets um, um, but as our business grew, we very quickly uh, had to, uh, to adopt um, more and, and, and better technology. We were on the fourth generation of our technology um, at the time that, uh, that our company went into administration, which was substantially reliant on artificial intelligence and machine learning to, uh, to deliver the solutions that we did. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and, and so, um, but the, the infrastructure of what we undertook um, was, somewhat unique in the in the marketplace and you know we were certainly for example um, amongst the biggest or the largest non-bank issuer uh, of bonds um, in the market so taking kind of millions of payments every day crunching them together and and delivering them onto to investors so the reason i ask about this is that david cameron i think explained that the reason he wanted to get involved was because you're exciting fintech now as a software engineer i can fully understand that you start a business with excel and make your way towards machine learning um, but I understand that at some point in this, you were using something called Tolia Systems. Was so was this? T tell us where Tolia, or how you pronounce it, where did that fit in in your technology journey? Certainly, uh, it's pronounced Talia. Um, and uh, um, so I guess we're even on this. We are even. There we yeah, go. Okay. At least yeah, on this square. Um, so 
uh, we, we worked with a, a bunch of different partners actually, um, and uh, Talia were specific specialists in, in working within an SAP environment, which is one of the largest ERP providers, um, which, you'll, which you'll understand. Um, we also worked directly with Oracle, and we worked directly with a number of other uh, software firms. I think we, uh, uh, we had more than 10 partnerships with, with different companies that we partnered with um, in order to have various capabilities that we needed to, uh, uh, to use. Um, of course, we then unify those um, with our own proprietary technology um, and uh, deliver them on. Like most uh, technology firms, we, we use some stuff under license and some of the stuff that we, we develop on a proprietary basis. So in a nutshell, what were you using machine learning to do? Certainly. Um, well, let's, since I, we're no doubt going to talk about the National Health Service, um, the, the, the learning there is to predict at an individual pharmacy level, what drugs are going to be prescribed in each individual pharmacy in England in the next two months um, and allowing those pharmacies to, uh, to be able to access cash against that prediction. So this um, is why I'm, forgive me, because I could ask you about the technology all day and no doubt your engineers as well, but this is really the point of what I'm getting at. Because on the one yeah. hand, you're still enthusiastic clearly about articulating your vision and what you were doing. But the, the central point here is the honesty of the claims being made by the firm and the honesty of the firm's business. There's no escaping that. And I think this goes back to the heart of the questions which were being asked earlier, this uh, rather semantic discussion about prospective versus future receivables. So when you talk about those prescriptions being made, just to play it back, make sure I've understood correctly, you're mm -hmm. saying that machine learning was used to predict what prescriptions would be made in the future and to use that info, information in order to provide credit? It's the two data points that we were um, having to predict um, was the number of prescriptions that would be fulfilled in each individual pharmacy. Yes. And the reimbursement value of each one of those prescriptions. Those, those are the two data points effectively that determined um, how much a pharmacy would receive in reimbursement um, yes. from the Department of Health. So I can see there's the complexity here because what you would do, I can see why people have used the word prospective because those prescriptions had not actually been made and yet you were providing uh, credit on the basis that they would be, yes? Correct. Okay. Can based, you... on, based on the historical performance, you know, the, the historical um, activity that had taken place in each one of those pharmacies in the country. Okay, so this, I think, really is the heart of the matter. So when some people look at that kind of business model and accuse you or it of being a fraudulent business model, mm -hmm. what would you say to them that makes it clear that it wasn't a fraud? Because I think that's the heart of what you're being held to account for here. Certainly. Uh, we were using data inside corporate systems uh, to allow the customers or suppliers that they have to be able to, for us to be able to unlock capital using that information and using the example here in the in the uk in the uh, um in the pharmacy scheme that meant that we were extending on average um, um at, a, at any point in time just under 300 million pounds on a consistent basis uh to pharmacies that wouldn't have been available to them otherwise and almost all of that went to small pharmacies whose cost of capital was being reimbursed to them by the government prior to the scheme being put in place um, at, a, at a double digit cost. So that saving accrued to the taxpayers using that technology. Now, I have to tell you, I'm quite uncomfortable with this degree of securitization, even securitization of people's wages. It, even as a free marketer, I don't think anybody on the committee would say I'm quite possibly the most free market member of the committee. But I'm still, even so, rather concerned by the degree of securitization you're engaging here, in here in order to drive down the cost of credit. What is it about it that caused that glimmer of excitement in your, in your face earlier about this kind of model? Why is it that we should, why would you tell us that we should be wanting to support this kind of business in the future? I, I wasn't asked to come and give evidence today to tell you why you should support well, I'm, ask, I'm asking you now because you told us earlier that mm -hmm. this is the with some pride, if I may say so, that this was the direction of travel in mm -hmm. which the world was headed. And you're, for the record, you're nodding. So that, in a sense, I, I, I'm really asked because I'm concerned now that this is a big, bigger problem for the future. If other firms 
end up with similar business models, failing to spot their absolute weakest link in the on the point, in your case, of the insurance. My goodness, what a mess we could get into if this is where the world is going. So I'm really asking you to make, to, to, in a sense, to, to tell all the journalists watching, all the mums and dads, all the policymakers and regulators, why, why should they be concerned to support this kind of business? I think the value has been to reduce the cost of capital in the economy very significantly uh, over the, uh, the last decade. Um, and with technology, we will get even better at being able to predict what's going to happen in the future. The key learning has to be, where does the risk for that failure sit? And in the case of my firm, Mr. Baker, um, because I relied on other investors, so our own proprietary balance sheet was insufficient to do this all by ourselves, that meant that um, if an insurance company withdrew, um, some of my third party uh, liquidity was no longer available. So I think the key question comes down to the durability of the capital that's supporting the businesses. And the durability of that capital can either come from that capital being within the control of the party that's providing the solution, or the durability could perhaps come from having greater certainty and longevity around the insurance that's being provided to um, uh, those, uh, those, those businesses, such as, such as my own. Would you agree with me that there's a major risk here that in using AI and machine learning to rapidly expand credit on a huge scale, that the risks of such a business model, indeed the risk inherent in any kind of use like this of that kind of technology, could very, very quickly expand beyond our capacity to regulate or cont contain those risks at all? And I think that's why you're asking questions of me so that you can make sure that you can understand those risks. Well, I certainly have learned something today. Thank you very much. Mr. Baker. Thanks, Steve. And to Harriet, please. Thank you, Chair. And um, I want to hark back to the time when your business was valued at $3.5 billion with the capital injection that you received from SoftBank. And I just want to ask you what you thought about that valuation at the time. My view of the valuation at the time was that it was consistent with the uh, valuation uh, of um, the business when our previous institutional investor um, had uh, had invested uh, about a year before. Um, so how, how many times earnings was it? 20 times. 20 times and, future earnings. And so you've it was 20 times one year forward. You, you've mentioned uh, quite a few times uh, during your evidence that uh, you obviously have a great pride in the service you were providing to uh, pharmacies in the UK. Um, can you quantify for the committee how much value you think uh, came from the fact that you were doing work um, that had the sort of imprimatur of the UK government on it, um, including, of course, uh, an advisory relationship with the former Prime Minister. When, when you ask the question, um, uh, Ms. Baldwin, about uh, the value, do you mean the kind of financial value or do you mean more broadly than that? I, I want to try and get a sense of whether you think that that $3.5 billion valuation had in it um, some kind of premium for the fact that you were obviously well embedded with the UK government and you had a former Prime Minister as one of your advisors. Sure. So uh, the multiple that, uh, that SoftBank Vision Fund invested at was um, roughly identical to, well, pretty much identical to the, um, the valuation uh, that the previous investment about a year before by General Atlantic had been, and General Atlantic's investment took place um, before we had um, started funding any UK government programs. So uh, I, I definitely think it was helpful, um, but uh, I don't think that it was definitive of the, the valuation given that the multiple remained, uh, remained the same. Um, and, and relative okay. to current market multiples of uh, uh, 20 times forward, um, would actually be relatively low for a, a company that uh, um, is in um, the financial technology space. 
Okay, thank you. Um, turning to this uh, sort of what looks to someone like myself as quite a sort of circular relationship in terms of some of the financing, you had SoftBank investing as a capital investor. Um, mm -hmm. Were there cases of funds uh, or, or firms rather that were both funding themselves through your supply chain finance product and then also investing either capital or investing in the funds themselves? No. So this report in 2019 from Bloomberg that said that Vodafone was putting invoices into a green seal sponsored supply chain finance fund and um, also participating as an investor. And then Vodafone's treasurer coming to work as your, your CFO. Um, it, it, that, that's not an example of what I described. Actually, I'm, I'm mistaken. I had forgotten that one instance. So uh, that, that uh, is, is the case. Um, uh, but of course, it's a not an investor in our equity. And I thought that was the question that you were asking me, Ms. Baldwin, um, was um, whether people were invested in the equity of Greensill Capital and we were then financing the same company. And the answer to that remains no. Um, in the case that you've just cited me from Vodafone, they were investing in a supply chain finance fund um, and we were also funding their supply chains um, however, to be clear, at no time was Vodafone an equity investor in Greensill Capital. Yeah, I asked about equity investor or um, supply chain finance uh, funds. I'm sorry if that's not well, clear, but I'm, you're saying I'm there was sorry. one one example. There was only one example, and that was Vodafone. Uh, I would say there are no examples where they, they were equity holders. Yeah, but a, a supply chain, someone who is getting supply chain finance from your funds and also investing in the funds. You'll appreciate that those funds, none of the funds were Greensill funds, um, and so they're not my clients, and so I don't know who were invested, and you would need to ask um, the, uh, the managers of those funds if they were prepared to breach client confidence to share that. Obviously, I can confirm to you the position with respect to Vodafone because it has been in the public domain. Okay, so um, you can't rule out that that was happening more extensively than just in the Vodafone example then? Uh, to the extent that it did happen, it would be a tiny, like, you know, less than 0.01% of the activity of our, our business. So it, it was not a core part of our business model, Ms. Uh, um, uh, Baldwin. And would it have been a potential conflict of interest that would have been noted in your policies and something that you actively managed about, or that the board was aware of? It's difficult to see how that would be a conflict of interest, uh, Ms. Baldwin. So no, actually, um, we didn't, um, because if, uh, if if you think about it, if someone invests in a fund, those funds will hold multiple assets. They are managed by a third-party fiduciary manager, not not mm. by Greensill. Um, that fiduciary makes investment decisions based on the rules of the fund, um, and uh, if a corporation or a financial institution wishes to invest in that fund, now, those funds are only funds that are open to professional investors. Um, and so those professional investors would, would make their own determination. So no, that was not something that we had a policy on. We did, however, have a policy with respect to providing facilities um, to entities that were related to our shareholders. Um, so I you couldn't be a shareholder and, and uh, um, we lend to you without there being a very specific process that had to go through the highest level in our board to be uh, to be approved. So uh, turning again to the SoftBank example, and they were clearly an equity investor. Uh, they also, it is reported, um, invested in Credit Suisse funds, but you're saying that was a separate organisation to yours and you you couldn't really get um, involved in that particular conflict of interest, but you were also receiving a loan directly from uh, SoftBank, as I understand it. Um, did you ever feel uncomfortable with all these different dependencies and different relationships that you had with SoftBank? Certainly. Um, I should be clear with you that the, the loan, uh, such as it is, uh, that is on Greensill's balance sheet with, uh, with SoftBank is a convertible loan um, that is essentially equity um, and it automatically converts into equity upon receiving regulatory approval um, uh, 
Greensill Capital is an, actually an Australian company and in Australia, foreign investors need approval to be able to invest. Um, and because we um, owned 100% of a bank in Germany, it also required German regulatory approval. So that loan automatically converted into equity when those approvals were granted and that loan carried an interest rate of zero and it had a 10 year term. So in effect, it was equity. So I just want to be clear there okay. with you that it was, it was in, for all intents and purposes, it was equity. But you had mentioned earlier that uh, Mr. Gupta sold his shares when he wanted to uh, benefit from the, the supply chain finance. But mm -hmm. you're saying that this was a different case with SoftBank because although they were an inve in equity investment, investor with you directly, yes. you were not at the time aware that they were also investing in some of the Credit Suisse funds? I was aware that uh, that they were investing in those funds, yes. Um, but uh, there was a, a meaningful gap in space and time between that. So their investments into, I think their last investment into, uh, into Greens, equity investment into, into Greens of Capital was, um, uh, I think in October, 2019, I believe. Um, and uh, uh, I think as reported in the, in the press, um, their investment uh, into the Credit Suisse funds um, was um, I think in the second quarter of, uh, of 2020. But help me out in terms of what distinction you make between the, that example and the example you gave earlier with uh, Mr Gupta's equity investment. Uh, well, Where the, the board the decided is, that he should sell his shares, yeah. Yeah, uh, so, uh, but I think if you think about the um, metrics there, uh, the here, SoftBank is a shareholder in Greensill, and uh, SoftBank was also an investor in a Credit Suisse fund. They're two separate kind of investments. Um, Greensill wasn't lending money to SoftBank, so the difference with the Gupta example okay. was um, Mr. Gupta was a client of our firm, and, and, and to be fair, there was that conflict for a very short period of time, which is why we ultimately, as our firm got bigger and we decided that wasn't a, uh, prudent for us, um, we decided we shouldn't have, uh, without very special approvals, shareholders that, uh, that that we lent money to. Okay, and can you talk um, a little bit more about the conflict of interest that came about from uh, SoftBank being an equity investor in your firm, and uh, for example, you getting involved in providing financing to some of the uh, companies that were in their vision fund? Were you lent upon to do that? No, we were not meant upon to, uh, to do that, um, but absolutely um, there were different additional controls uh, required there. Uh, so for example, um, I stepped down from, so when our company was young, I sat on all of the committees in the, in the company, obviously uh, as we got bigger, um, that was no longer appropriate. And in the case of both the credit committee and the risk committee of the firm, uh, I stepped down from, from those committees and nor was any other board member a, uh, a member of the credit committee. Uh, the, the risk committee, of course, did have members of the board sit on it, but I was not uh, a member. Those controls were there to make sure that credit was extended, uh, was done so purely on a standalone basis, taking account of the, uh, the veracity of the, 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 uh, the company in question, uh, and not based on kind of uh, who um, one of their minority shareholders might have been. So it was just complete coincidence that so many of the Vision Fund uh, investments were also customers of yours. We were introduced to those companies by SoftBank. Um, so there was no sort of coincidence, um, but it is, uh, it, but we obviously did business with, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, hundreds of, uh, of, of companies uh, and uh, SoftBank vision fund companies um, amount to a very small handful of, of those, fewer than fewer than 10. But I mean, the FT has reported, for example, that you only started financing uh, the car company FAIR after they'd already become, you know, it become quite evident that they had uh, difficulties. The chief executive had announced plans to cut 40% of the workforce and had resigned, for example. Um, did you feel lent upon by SoftBank in that example? No, I did not feel lent upon by SoftBank, um, and the uh, that particular facility, um, which uh, is, has been repaid in full, 
um, uh, did not result in any loss to uh, uh, to our company and was 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 repaid a hundred percent. So, so you, uh, I guess you, yeah. you don't feel that throughout this uh, this period um, of incredible expansion in terms of the business that you were doing that you uh, came across any. Uh, business that represented in what uh, anything written by your firm that was represented a conflict of interest in any way. Uh, in any business, there's going to be conflicts. Um, what I would say to you is that we felt that we managed those conflicts by keeping the decision making separate. Um, so I'm I'm not saying to you there's no conflict whatsoever. There obviously is some conflict between a minority shareholder in a company that we lend to and a shareholder in our company, the management of that to try and mitigate the risk of that conflict is about separation. But also when we sold those investments to, to our customers, uh, to our investors that bought those assets, they were aware of that information and those assets came protected with insurance to protect them against an event of default, but they had the full information to make that determination. So I, I think there's several layers of, of uh, consideration there, but I'm not saying to you there is no conflict. What I'm saying is we aim to manage it and we gave uh, disclosure. And if you were a regulator, mm -hmm. because to me, this sounds all quite quite worrying. That there was a bit of an arm's length, but it you know doesn't really pass the spell the smell test to me, to me now. If you were a regulator, what uh, change would you make in terms of the regulations? Well, certainly in the case of um, Credit Suisse, which which you've alluded to, that was reported in the press, as has also been reported in the press. Uh, Credit Suisse had an independent review conducted of that, um, and they proposed uh, certain changes to the to the rules of the fund, uh, but uh, uh, they continued to, uh, to 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 provide the fund. In the case of my business, um, I think the um, as as we got bigger, what we aim to do and what we would have needed to continue doing um, is to have further controls to separate um, the ability of shareholders to influence the extension of uh, of, of credit. But I am satisfied that um, we, we did a, a fair job of that um, throughout this process, especially given um, that there was the disclosure to, to our, our, our end investors. But what I'm hearing you say is that you do acknowledge that your shareholders did influence the extension of credit. No, what I said is that there is a conflict of interest there. And that is why we separated our shareholders from the decision-making process around the extension of credit. I'll let uh, those listening decide uh, what uh, what they think uh, it, it should be done. Uh, and no doubt we will comment on this in our report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, Emma, please. Thank you, Chair. I was a little surprised at the beginning, Mr. Greensill, to hear you discredit the evidence given by Lord Miners. And I do hope he is given the right of reply to this, uh, to this session to actually clarify some of the points you made. But I, I want to start with some pretty quick questions, if that's okay. Has Greensill ever been under investigation by the FCA? We appreciate that it would be a criminal offence to comment on that. Can you clarify whether you've been under investigation by the FCA? Um, the answer to that is the same. Okay, so back in 2018, which is obviously prior to the in, in what's happening now, when the FCA were looking into the GM, uh, GAM scandal, were they looking into Greensill as well? Okay, the answer is the same. I can't comment on that. So you can't comment on an FCA investigation that happened in 2018, which is not what we're talking about right now. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to give advice on whether I am allowed to do that. And if I am, I'm happy to give you a written response uh, on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and also, can you just confirm, obviously without naming recipients, whether you uh, had eight lots of £50 million pound loans? Sorry, eight lots of £50 million pound loans, I'm sorry. 
yeah, in the answer, because you didn't quite answer the questions to my colleague with Shanara before about whether or not, you, you said because again, you weren't able to give evidence, whether or not how many loans you actually had, C-bills loans. Right. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to, uh, to comment specifically on the, uh, the facilities that we've extended. Right, so I'm not asking for the names of the recipients, I'm just asking you to clarify how many loans you've had. Um, and I need to take advice on whether I'm able to, uh, to answer that question. Um, and I'm happy to give you a written answer afterwards, if, uh, if I am allowed to. Right, let's try another one then. Um, did the government, officials, advisors or ministers play any role in introducing you to Mr Gupta? No. Okay, can you explain how and when Mr Gupta started working with Greensill Capital? Yes, I, I did answer that question a little earlier, um, Ms Hardy, but uh, just to, to answer you again, uh, I was introduced to, to Mr Gupta in, uh, in, I believe it was in 2015, uh, by uh, uh, an executive at, uh, at an insurance company. Okay, and following all the evidence you've given so far, I'm just going to ask you this as a straight question. Do you think it's appropriate that a firm like yours was not regulated by either the Bank of England or the Financial Conduct Authority? Well, we didn't take uh, deposits from consumers in the United Kingdom. Um, and we, uh, the only product that we provided in the United Kingdom was business lending um, and business lending of which supply chain financing forms a, a, a small subset. Business lending is generally not regulated. Um, so that's obviously a decision for this committee and for the government as to what's, what should be regulated or not. Um, uh, I, I have said to you, you asked me to give you my honest assessment of why I think that my firm failed. And I think that the reason that my firm failed um, is because of our um, uh, over-reliance on uh, a single insurer um, who withdrew capacity, I believe, because of um, uh, COVID-related uh, events. Um, and so uh, that's my view as to why we failed. Um, but I would say to you that we did own a, uh, a bank um, and... And, and therefore, we, we dealt with a prudential regulator in the in the context of uh, of, of that as well. Um, we do think that as we got bigger, we expected to be ever more regulated, and we we welcomed um, that position. But our core business is not a regulated activity in Britain, nor is it in very many countries around the world, um, nor is business credit generally. Okay, and now, bearing in mind, you obviously discredited the evidence of Lord Miners earlier, but Lord Miners said uh, in the evidence he gave to us, and I'm quoting, that Mr. Greenstead had clearly decided that he did not want his business to be regulated by anyone. Is that what attracted you to the business model you adopted, the lack of regulation? Not at all. Um, the, uh, the, the business that uh, we undertake, undertook um, is, is no better or worse for, for want of regulation. Um, and you'll appreciate that um, much of our activities took place where we worked with counterparties that um, were highly regulated and therefore we were required to operate to their standards. Um, and, uh, and so therefore, um, I, I don't see that there was um, any particular advantage uh, granted to our firm um, by virtue of our regulatory position. So for example, um, much of the business that we undertook of extending supply chain finance uh, certainly in, uh, in, in Europe, was conducted through our German bank, and so therefore fully regulated. Okay, now I, I understand you can't tell or answer the question that, as to whether or not you've been investigated by the FCA either now or back in 2018, but I wonder, Mr Greensill, would you expect a business who was under uh, investigation by the FCA to declare that to the Treasury and to the British Business Bank before doing business with them? Uh, I, I don't uh, have a, a, a view on that. I, I, we would be complying, we would comply at all times with whatever the, uh, the legal requirements were. 
Okay. In, in its written evidence to the committee, the Bank of England notes that the first indication that the bank had a potential weakness at Greensill was in March 2020. This suggested a possible weakness in controls rather than crystallized financial difficulties. That's a quote from the bank. Were you ever made aware of weakness in, weaknesses in your controls? And if so, what was the weaknesses and what was your corrective action? Yes, obviously I read the same letter that you did, um, um, Ms Hardy. Uh, I, the, the Bank of England has not provided me with the particulars of what it was that they were referring to, so I can only speculate as to uh, what I think they were referring to. Um, but it is um, my sense that they are um, probably referring to um, discussions that uh, were taking place with the Deposit Protection uh, Authority in Germany around the concentration of one of our particular customers um, and uh, the plan that we'd agreed with them to um, progressively um, bring that into uh, um, a, a lower level of concentration. But to be honest with you, I don't know because the Bank of England didn't disclose to me what, uh, what the nature of that correspondence was. And did you not sort of think to ask, considering the Bank of England's writing about your company? Uh, well, I was only provided with these letters um, kind of uh, a day or two ago. So, uh, um, no, I didn't think that I would get an answer from the Governor of the Bank of England uh, in, uh, in, in, in a matter of a day or two. I have just, with you giving evidence to a committee in public, I just thought you might want to clarify what the Bank of England is writing about your company. But OK, um, how much contact did you have with regulators? Uh, well, the, uh, the FCA Chief Executive's letter um, lists the interactions that, uh, that we, we had with them. Um, we aim to be proactive in talking to them about what we did and um, what we were looking to develop. Um, uh, for example, uh, before we launched the earned product, we went and talked to the, uh, the FCA about, uh, about that product as well. Um, uh, we obviously had extensive discussions with, uh, um, with uh, um, the, uh, the regulators in, in Germany over a, over a long period because of our ownership of, uh, of, of Greensill Bank. Um, uh, so uh, I guess you know, we, we had a dialogue with them. Um, I don't think that our level of dialogue with uh, the British um, regulator was anything like what a bank in Britain would have with, with, uh, um, with the regulator. Um, but I guess that's because we didn't take deposits here in the UK and we didn't extend um, credit that we were charging interest on to consumers. Okay, and did the regulators take more interest in your business following the events surrounding the GAM fund in 2019? I'm, I'm sorry, could you ask that question again, please, Ms Hardy? Of course. Did the regulators seem to take more interest in your business following the events surrounding the GAM fund in 2019? Not that I noticed. Okay, so there was no additional interest after GMA, is that what you're saying, in your business? Uh, not, not that I noticed, no. Okay, why did you use the appointed representative feature for Greensill Capital Securities Limited rather than seeking to get the regulatory permission yourself? Sure, you, you'll appreciate that Greensill Capital was a, a nine-year-old firm. Um, we grew uh, over, over a period of time. Um, we worked with quite a number of broker dealers, um, uh, so third parties who are very significant financial institutions who are major broker dealers uh, um, on an international basis, um, so here in London and, uh, and, and abroad. Um, but over time, uh, we determined that it would be sensible for us to have our own regulatory capability, um, uh, but we expected that to be a pretty modest portion of um, our overall activities. Um, and uh, um, uh, we uh, have therefore considered, given our size, that it made sense for us to uh, uh, to make use of the uh, um, the appointed representative structure, which, as the the, uh, the letter from the chief executive of the FCA points out, is is used by forty thousand businesses um, in the UK. Um, I'm sure your question to me though really is, is there a lesson to be learned from that? Um, I think there are two comments I would uh, would make to that, Ms. Hardy. One is uh, that um, we fully planned and expected to um, move towards being um, so doing away with the appointed representative and bringing that completely in-house. Um, and indeed, uh, we had discussions at a board level uh, around that over the, the six months uh, at the, uh, the back end of last year. Um, and 
but I think if you were looking to make changes and you were asking me that question, uh, I would say there may well be a volume threshold limit um, where the appointed representative scheme should not be used. Um, and obviously, although we started out being incredibly small um, in the uh, appointed representative um, uh, program, that grew over time as our business grew. And it may well be that uh, there, there ought to be a threshold at which that's no longer acceptable. Okay, now earlier on, you discredited the evidence again from miners, which was around the cost to the taxpayer being of five uh, billion. You said it wouldn't be one billion either. I think you used the phrase, if I can remember correctly, around 400, a mere 400 million cost to the taxpayer. But you'll be aware that um, earlier on, the FE released a piece which was titled, How Lex Greensill Helped Sow the Seeds of the Carillion Crisis. Now, you say that you weren't involved in the Carillion Crisis in providing supply chain finance. You had a company, and I end up pronouncing this wrong, so you can obviously correct me, called Textura, which sold, since was sold to Oracle, used Greensill as a supply chain finance, and they sold it debt to Carillion. Isn't it the case that you have not only a hand in the a green seal disaster, which is going to cost the taxpayer billions, but also the Carillion disaster, which ended up costing around seven billion pounds of debt? I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Hardy. I'm, did you say that? I'm asking. Would you, would you, you mind? Would you mind reading me the, the the quote because that doesn't make any sense to me. The involvement in the Carillion crisis in providing supply chain finance. A company called Texture, which was since sold to Oracle, used Greensill as a supply chain finance and then sold it to Carillion. So I'm asking what the link is between Carillion and the debt that ended up costing the taxpayer and your company, Greensill. Texture was purchased by Oracle. Yes. Used Greensill. Not, not by Carillion. Chain, used Greensill as a supply chain finance and then sold it to Carillion. No, uh, no? That, okay. that, is not, that is not correct. So, so sorry, so Texture, which was sold to Oracle, did not use Greensill as a supply chain finance. That didn't happen. No, uh, Oracle, through Textura, did use Greensill for providing supply chain finance. Um, what did not happen is Textura was not sold to Carillion, and Textura did not sell a supply chain finance program or capability to um, Carillion. Right, so the, so the journalist has got that wrong? It would seem that the journalist has. Okay, okay, that's fine. So you had no hand in the Carillion uh, crisis whatsoever through using green seal supply chain finance? Absolutely not. Oh, well, that's one thing you can cross off your list then, that's good. Okay, Thank thanks you. very much. And there are press reports that you struggle to find a new auditor to replace Safri Champness. Is this true? So our group auditor was Nexia International, um, of which Safri Champness is the UK member. Uh, Nexia International, um, according to their website, is the eighth largest audit firm in the world. Um, we did business with Nexia um, at the request of um, our, um, our auditors. Um, I apologize, our regulator in Germany who specified that they wished us to continue to use the same auditor at our bank as had been in place before we purchased um, the other uh, bank. Um, and that uh, meant that we actually needed to switch because prior to that, our auditors were Grand Thornton. Um, and then when we purchased our, our bank um, in 2014, uh, the, uh, one of the conditions of that from, uh, from one of the regulators in Germany was that they required us to continue to use the bank's auditor um, and uh, um, Grant Thornton would not uh, uh, have that be the case. They, they, uh, um, and so therefore um, we had to use the international group of which the German auditor, which is called Ebner Stolz, um, formed a, a member of, which was a part of the Nexia group. Um, but uh, to emphasize, Greensill Capital is an Australian company um, and so the principal auditor is Nexia International, of which Safra Champus was their UK partner and they audited our UK operating entity. Thank you. How easy do you think it was to audit Greensill? And where did auditors have to pay particular attention and what did they often ask you about? 
uh, I, I'm not an auditor, so I don't know whether auditing our firm was kind of any easier or more difficult than auditing any other um, financial institution. Uh, I, I would say to you that kind of the volume of transactions that we financed is a significant number because they are uh, in effect, lots of relatively small receivables that, uh, that, that we purchase, um, but uh, they're centralized uh, into a, a, a couple of um, country jurisdictions. But of course, we did business in many countries around the world and, and no doubt that creates a, a level of, uh, of, of complexity. Okay, um, final question. What was the news that Greensill representatives said that they were, quote, very pleased to hear from the Treasury in an exchange of emails on the 24th of April, 2020? I, I don't immediately know what it was that um, was that particular news. So I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head, but uh, I'd, I'd be happy to consult my notes and, and see what that, uh, um, what that was and provide you with a, a, a written answer, Ms Hardy. Okay, so just to clarify, you're going to be writing to us if you can to let us know whether Greensill has been under investigation by the FCA and to clarify what it was that excited Greensill representatives so much from the Treasury on the 24th of April. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Emma. And going to go to Anthony, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I refer everyone to my members of uh, registers interests uh, I've been an investor in and on the board of and an advisor to a range of uh, large range of financial technology companies one of which hasty is in the same line of business as earned and I used to work at Morgan Stanley as well but I don't think we ever overlapped or met there um the my first question I just want to follow up the point that uh, Emma Hardy was asking about that were you saying it's against the law for you to say whether you have been investigated by the FCA in the past and if so which law is that uh, um I, I would say, Mr. Brown, that uh, I don't want to um, break the law. And so what I've said is that I will provide you with a written answer if, uh, if I am allowed to do that. Uh, I, I have not brought a solicitor with me to, uh, you're, um, you're to, to yourself, this hearing. You? I thought you were a lawyer yourself. Uh, I'm not an expert on UK regulatory matters, Mr. Okay. Brown. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, as former Chief Secretary of the Bank Association, I can tell you people are quite open about whether they've been investigated by the FCA in the past. So I might be well, wrong, but I certainly don't well, think there's any well, law. Well, about in which, that. in which case I will uh, I will provide you with a written answer to your question. The, the two things I'm interested in and finding out in my questions to you are, re are really the, the regulatory lessons uh, from this, and you've touched on a bit of that, but then also uh, about uh, the sort of potential use or abuse of public authority. Um, on the on the regulatory lessons, uh, as you said, supply chain finance isn't regulated. It's business to business lending. It's uh, you know it's a contract, civil contract between two businesses. Um, you did point suggest there are aspects of your operation that should where regulation should change like the appointed representative regime you said there should be a volume threshold and that sort of makes sense when you get a certain size you can't use that anymore um are there, are there any other aspects of the operation that you think regulators should look at we, we are speaking to the fca uh tomorrow i think that uh, um it, it is the case as uh, indeed lord minor said that it is important to think about um, the asset liability mix um, of kind of all financial institutions and particularly uh, ones uh, such as mine. And, uh, and so I think he was right to ask those, those questions. Um, and uh, I would suggest that uh, there, there definitely is a, a question around um, you know, uh, financial technology companies um, making sure and having robust controls around their asset liability matching. Um, in, in our case, um, the kind of, the reality was the assets and the liabilities matched, but only with respect to part of our business, only so long as insurance was there. So kind of regular asset liability rules would say you were fine, but in fact, actually um, not necessarily take account of the, that critical ingredient of, uh, of, of the insurance. So it seems to me there may well be some merit in, in giving that further consideration, Mr. Brown. And, and what would be that merit? Because normally the, the attitude of the regulators is, as you said, it's it, it's consumer protection and deposit protection, and you, you yes. didn't make deposits and your consumers, as I understand, didn't, didn't lose out directly. But what, what would be the, because if we're going to make recommendations about changes to regulation, it'd be good to understand exactly what the benefit would be of doing that or and how widely you would do it. Yep. I, I, Mr. Brown, I, I'm, I'm not a, 
uh, an expert here, I, I guess I wanted to just call your attention to I, I, that. That clearly is a consideration. The way that um, kind of uh, insurance fits into asset liability management. I, I'm not sure what the appropriate formulation uh, would be. Um, I would say, with respect to insurance, the, the the principal question that I would kind of ask you to to perhaps consider um, is that inherent kind of um, counter cyclicality of insurance and, and and I'm sure you have seen this in your previous capacities writ large where credit insurers withdraw credit insurance at exactly the moment when it is most needed um, in the economy because of the way that the, the solvency regulations work and that seems to me to be a, an inherent flaw and the, the failure of my business is, is in, in part evidence of that, uh, that, that flaw it seems to me. Okay. I don't want to ask about your, your public sector work. You, you um, just how you obviously you had uh, in a lot of dealings with uh, governments and uh, clients of government. How important was that to your uh, business model, the public sector versus your private sector work? Certainly, um, from a revenue perspective, the public sector business was uh, was negligible. Um, from a volume perspective, um, it was um, moderately. Uh, important. It, it accounted for uh, a couple of percent of our uh, volume um, on, a, on an annual basis, I would, uh, I would approximate. Um, but uh, I think the, to us, the, the value of the activity that we undertook uh, in government was, if I can be, um, maybe tell you a truth that is uncomfortable for people in government to hear, um, the truth is that government tends to be less efficient than the private sector. And so when one is working to make savings, um, it's easier to prove larger savings um, in a public sector uh, environment. And when you are a business that doesn't have a brand that everybody knows, and therefore people are looking at actual value cases where real value has been, uh, has been captured, um, that's certainly something that's very kind of evident uh, in, uh, in, in the business that we did for the government. And as I cited to you, the very, very significant ongoing savings um, in the procurement of drugs in this country as a consequence of, of, uh, of, of that solution. So it is that as a proof case, um, which the private sector then looks to um, when they're considering what, what they're doing uh, in, in terms of um, improving uh, their own uh, supply chains. I'm, uh, I completely agree. Agree with you about the inefficiency, inefficiency of government and the ability, in certain circumstances, of private sectors to uh, help in, increase in efficiency. Just on, on the um, supply chain finance with the uh, with the pharmacies, which you just mentioned, that the presumably if the uh, if the government did pay uh, its bills on time within say ten working days, uh, then there would be no room for any supply chain finance. I'm very glad that you raised that point. Um, it is, of course, government policy to pay suppliers within 10 days. Uh, yeah, that's um, the point. Yeah, and I was in charge of the, the payment terms in, uh, in the Greater London Authority and Boris is now. Yes. And, and so uh, on the face of it, it's crazy to, to implement supply chain finance. It's crazy to use private sector money, which on the face of it ought to be more expensive than um, where the government can borrow money um, to, uh, to do this. And it's crazy to have an intermediary in the mix who's presumably taking some profit out and therefore uh, is, a, is, a, is a effectively a tax. And the truth, unfortunately, Mr. Brown, is, is somewhat different. Um, the, the, the truth is that uh, unlike the private sector, government doesn't have the capacity to approve its invoices very, very promptly. Um, and so as a consequence of that, there is a delay, even though you want to pay within 10 days, there's a, there is often a delay. Um, that delay, if one looks at what the private sector does, um, that delay can be solved using analytics, machine learning algorithms um, to accelerate that process. Um, but um, to, one private sector can bring that learning, which is part of what we did. Um, the second is paying suppliers faster to previously government paid in 30 days and, and then it was changed to 10 days, arguably, why not pay them in one day? Well, that's actually a cost to the taxpayer because the exchequer has to borrow that money to provide it. What the private sector does with the supply chain solutions that, uh, that are provided is that allows the people who benefit from it 
that is the suppliers to government, if they want to get paid faster, they can pay for it rather than the taxpayer paying for it. Because the truth is the majority of expenditure the government has with suppliers is not with small businesses, but is with massive multinationals. And do you really want to be subsidizing their cost of capital? So have the private sector provide it and have those that want to use it, take advantage of it. Um, and the, the third point then, and the final point that I would make is that in fact, even if you did devolve to government departments, the authority to, uh, to uh, um, pay using private sector technology and just use their own cash, the reality is that that capital is charged out at a much higher cost by departments than the private sector provides. And the reason for that, as I'm sure you're very aware, is that although Treasury can borrow money very cheaply, it provides it to departments at, and I'm not gonna use the right word, I'm sorry, but effectively a weighted average cost of capital at where overall the government borrows money. Whereas if you're advancing money to a supplier to government on 30 days faster than they were getting paid before, then I as a financial institution am borrowing money for 30 days, taking government risk, that's a lot cheaper to fund than 10 year weighted average cost of borrowing for, for the exchequer, which it passes through to departments. And, and I'll use the 10 year as an example. Uh, but so there's a very big difference between the two. And so have the private sector benefit from it, have them pay for it, but have it actually be cheaper than the government departments would actually be able to do that based on the cost of capital that treasury provides. That was the rationale for, uh, for, for doing what we did. Yeah. Do you, um, can you explain exactly what your role at number 10 was, what you were at number 10? So I was brought into the cabinet office um, in, uh, in 2012. And uh, the, as you'll appreciate, it was in the, the wreckage post the financial crisis where there was a real focus on um, helping small businesses and help improve their access to credit. So the, the, uh, uh, the challenge that was, was leveled to me was, um, are there ways that I could provide advice based on my experiences um, that, uh, that would enable government to make interventions that uh, helped uh, small businesses to, uh, um, to get cheaper access to credit or, or better access to, to credit. Um, so that was the, the reason that, uh, that I was brought in um, and uh, I provided those services um, to the government uh, at no cost. Um, I, I was simply trying to share my, uh, my, my, uh, my experience um, and, uh, and give something back. And this is before you set up Greensill? No, I had set up Green Greensill is an Australian company and so Greensill was uh, set up in late 2011. Um, and uh, I was um, engaged by the cabinet office uh, in February, 2012. And so did you use your position in the cabinet office, uh, as you say, uh, to influence any uh, commercial contracts with government to gain access to people who might be interested in signing contracts with Greensill? Absolutely not. The first, government related business that Greensill Capital uh, ever won and funded against was in July 2018. Um, and Greensill Capital didn't have any customers here in the United Kingdom um, until 2015. So- After, uh, after you left the cabinet office. Uh, actually, I was still a Crown representative uh, at that time. And what, um, what's the role that, I think that this Crown representative, I must admit, I hadn't, not really aware of their role. What, what, what do they do? Uh, I, I didn't create the scheme, so I'll, oh, I'll, no, give, you I, my pot, I'll give you my potted version of it, uh, Mr. Brown. Um, but uh, I think the intent behind the, uh, the program was to bring private sector um, expertise and to assist with commercial um, negotiations with suppliers to government to ensure that government could get the best possible deal. And so you were a Crown representative while trying to get contracts for Green Seal with the government? No, 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 sir. Um, what I said is that the first time that Green Seal Capital had even a customer in Britain, not nothing to do with the British oh, government, no. but a, a, a customer in Britain, the first time it did um, was, uh, was, in, uh, was in 2015. And, that, and you were no longer a Crown representative at that point? I, I was a Crown representative at that point. 
but that company had nothing to do with the, the government. government. And by the time you had a first government contract, you were no longer a Crown representative. It was more than two years after I had ceased to be a Crown representative. So. Right, because there, uh, there was an article uh, in the Times uh, in, on the 27th of March 2021, uh, noted confusion about how a report ended up on the uh, then Prime Minister David Cameron's desk advocating supply chain finance for pharmacists. Uh, and it was confusion over who, how that report actually ended up in the Prime Minister's uh, uh, red box. I'm sure you saw it. Uh, did you have any involvement with the writing of that report? Unfortunately, the uh, the Times didn't provide me with a copy of uh, the report that they're referring to. Um, and given that I'm uh, ceased having access to government email systems um, more than five years ago, uh, I'm, I'm not able to to see the exact report or the correspondence that related to that. But what I can say to you is that um, it would not have been possible that a report that I could have written would have ended up in the Prime Minister's box. So I'm sure, Mr Brown, you're aware of the processes and controls that sit around that. It would simply be impossible for uh, an advisor to write a report that, that uh, ended up in the Prime Minister's box um, unless it had been reviewed by, by others and determined that it was, by, was worthy. By, but Jeremy, I, I, by Jeremy Hayward. Another former, uh, who you met at Morgan Stanley. That's correct. But he, as in, he, it's correct. I met him at Morgan Stanley, uh, Mr. Brown. Yeah, but it, he could have put the paper, the document in the Prime Minister's box, and could have got it from you. Uh, I, I can't speculate as to uh, as as to that, Mr. Brown. But I, 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 I guess that's possible. He was the cabinet secretary. Uh, but you, and you don't know whether you don't know whether this Times report is true though about whether a report you wrote ended up in the red box about supply chain finance for pharmacies, which then the Prime Minister then adopted as a policy. Uh, I, I wrote a number of papers that it's my belief ended up uh, in uh, in the Prime Minister's red box, um, and the pharmacy scheme uh, was a, a scheme that was announced uh, by the Prime Minister. Um, at the roundtable that was held, I think it was in October 2012, I think, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, so that formed part of the group of announcements that were made by Number 10 uh, uh, in conjunction with that, uh, that roundtable. Okay, I would love to ask you more questions, but I'm afraid I've run out of time, but thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thanks, Anthony. And going back to Angela, please. Thank you uh, very much. Um, why, uh, why did you have David Cameron as an advisor to your company, uh, Mr. Greensill? Uh, what was his role? Certainly. So my board and I uh, decided to um, approach David Cameron to prospectively become a, uh, an advisor to us. And um, actually, in the event of uh, we, we had recently lost um, a procurement process with a, a significant blue chip company um, uh, where, although we had the better technology, um, that, uh, that, that company had taken the view that they didn't recognize our brand, uh, they didn't know who I was. Um, and so um, I guess we were thinking about um, how we could um, grow and expand um, um, the brand awareness of, uh, of ourselves as a, uh, as a firm. Okay, and uh, prior to him joining the company, how much contact had you had with him, particularly in your time in government? Uh, I, I met him a couple of times um, um, in the time that uh, that I worked for the cabinet office. But you've, you you would say then you didn't really come across him very much. Well, you didn't I, really know him. I, I wouldn't say that uh, Mr. Cameron and I were friends. friends. No. Okay, uh, what? Is his job description and role, would you say? I mean, we've seen advisor, but can you, can you enlighten us a bit more about the job that he's been doing for you? So Mr. Cameron uh, advised us with respect to the um, growth of our business, um, you know, in the time period that, uh, that Mr. Cameron was an advisor to our firm, um, we added more than a hundred countries uh, to the number of countries that we purchased receivables from, from customers in. Uh, and of course, that um, analysis and geopolitical thinking was something that, uh, that Mr. Cameron assisted us with. Uh, Mr. Cameron also uh, uh, met with many of our uh, current uh, and prospective 
customers and indeed partners that, uh, that, that we did business with and, uh, and, and generally um, assisted us with, uh, with the, uh, the growth of, uh, of our firm. Okay, so clearly a, a, a successful relationship from your point of view. How was he employed? Was he a PAYE employee or did you pay him um, per hour or, or what? He was a PAYE employee. He was a PAYE employee. Okay. Yes. And was he employed by the UK part of the company or by a foreign part of the company? The UK. Okay. And uh, would, so was he, even though he wasn't a board member, I'm assuming he wasn't a board member. That's correct. He was not a director of the company. Okay. Did he attend board meetings? He had a standing invitation to attend. And did he do that regularly? Yes. Okay. Um, what were the value of the share options? Well, certainly the percentage of share options that he was allocated. We've heard 1% um, bandied about. Is, is it that or is it different? Yeah. Uh, you'll appreciate, Damien and Angela, that I'm not allowed to kind of give you the exact numbers, but I can tell you that it was less than 1%. Less than 1%? More That's than correct. half a percent? Uh, I'm not going to haggle with you at all. I, I, I would say it's less than the one percent that's been uh, that's been bandied around in the press. Okay. What, is there any reason why you can't tell us what that is? There doesn't seem well, to be any reason. I mean, I, I um, you, lots of I think people that, think money's quite a quite a nice thing. Uh, are you embarrassed about talking about money? No, I'm I'm very careful though about respecting the confidence of uh, people who are employees of the company, and I understand that Mr. Cameron's giving evidence to you in two days' time, Dame Angela. So perhaps it would be most optimal for you to ask that question directly of him. Well, I had noticed that we've got that coming up, so don't worry. I'm sure that um, some question along those lines will will come from one of us, maybe not me. Who knows? Uh, before he agreed to approach the Chancellor about the CCF scheme. Um, did you give him any briefing notes to let him know what you, it, it was you wanted him to lobby for on your behalf? Uh, so, Mr Cameron and I definitely talked about the matter before he, uh, uh, he uh, spoke with uh, anybody in the Bank of England or in, uh, in Treasury. Uh, I believe that uh, he had sight of the submission that we had made to the Bank of England um, when they would, uh, prior to the implementation of the CCFF, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've perused the material that the, the Governor of the Bank of England provided. We, we, we heard what the Governor, the then Governor had said, where he had said that he thought that there would be need for a, a Bank of England support for supply chains. Um, and so we, we wrote to him, so Mr Cameron had seen that. And then we made, once the, the scheme was announced, Dame Angela, um, we made an application to the Bank of England and Mr Cameron um, would have had visibility uh, to that application. Uh, I don't recall that he would have been provided with anything above and beyond um, that which we had provided and therefore is now in the public domain. Okay, so there's nothing else to publish about about that as far as you can tell? Not, not to my recollection, Dame Angela. And how much use did Mr Cameron make of your private jets, the four that you your company had? Uh, that would be for Mr. Cameron to uh, to comment on, Dame Angela. Oh, come on, that's not a secret, surely. I mean, it's a cost for your company. Uh, again... We've seen these photographs of him all over the place talking to people. He must have made some use of your private jets. Did did he have one to hand or did he generally go with you? What so what was the what was the 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 way that you organized the use of these private jets in the company? Sure. The private aircraft that the company had were for um, the use of executives of the company um, and uh, David and I, uh, I apologize, Mr Cameron and I did travel together uh, on uh, company aircraft and um, uh, that was certainly an efficient way of getting around. So presumably there's, there's records of all of that? In Absolutely. There so are records of every aircraft usage that um, ever took place. Okay. Uh, uh, and why uh, was Mr Cameron uh, meeting with your insurers in Australia? Because there was a meeting there that you had with insurers. That's correct, he did. Um, so uh, Mr Cameron was in Australia uh, speaking at um, 
uh, a uh, an event out there. Um, forgive me, I realize you're going to want to know um, who that is. Uh, so he was uh, uh, in Australia on a, uh, a speaking tour um, where he was speaking for the um, at um, at the invitation of the United Israel Appeal. Um, and given that he was in Australia uh, already, uh, he um, provided one morning of his time while he was there. And during that time, he met with uh, a group of um, our current and uh, prospective customers and also met with the um, one of only two Australian insurance companies that we we worked with. Uh, he met with the, the chief executive and a number of other um, board directors of uh, that insurance company together with our broker Marsh. Um, and uh, that uh, was consistent with what he had done in meeting with other insurance companies who, who partnered with us and other um, institutions generally that worked with us. Okay, that's that's uh, good. Thank you. And finally, did uh, this is just uh, something that's come up from something you've said uh, in earlier evidence, but did Credit Suisse ever reject any paper that you offered for securitization? Yes, they did. Uh, and was that a regular occurrence? I, I would uh, I would think it probably happened uh, a couple of times a month, I would think, Dame Angela. Uh, and you may say, well, why was that not more frequent? And the answer to that is that the funds that Credit Suisse operated um, uh, had very clear rules around the eligibility of assets that could go into them. Yeah. We, we didn't change customers very often because you'll appreciate once you're financing the supply chain of a company that you kind of keep doing it um, for an extended period of time. Um, and so uh, consequently, um, it would be unusual for them to reject a transaction. Most likely it might be if it's, a, for example, a new customer um, that perhaps they uh, you know, didn't adjudicate with within uh, the, uh, the rules. But in terms of actual limits, those limits are just a mathematical calculation relative to the to information they've told us as to capacity and the rules of the fund. So obviously we wouldn't offer them something that we knew to be in breach of the of the rules. Does that answer but your they, question? Okay, so they, they turned you down sometimes. What did you then do with those with those assets that you tried to securitize? Certainly, Credit Suisse was definitely the largest of our investors, Dame Angela, um, but it certainly was not the only one. Um, there were 52 banks that bought assets from us and several dozen institutional investors uh, who also bought assets from us, including many significant institutional investors here in Britain that you would, you would know well. Um, uh, and so you know, uh, an asset that was offered to them if they declined it would, would likely end up being purchased either by Greensill Bank or by one of the, the dozens and dozens of other investors who, who purchased assets from us on a daily basis. So your own bank purchased the assets if you couldn't send them perhaps to the uh, Credit Suisse funds. This is the bank that um, the uh, BaFin of, uh, of are now investigating, isn't it, in Germany? That is correct. Yeah, and they're, they're looking at criminal uh, charges over there, are they not? There have not been no criminal charges laid against uh, um, staff of, um, of of Greensill Bank, but I've certainly read of the commentary in the uh, in the press. And there are some um, German towns who invested institutionally in that bank that have lost a lot of money as a result of what's happened. Uh, I, like you, I have read that in the press as well. So there are more, there's more than one uh, loser here. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks, Angela. And finally going to Julie, please. Thank you, Chair. And um, thank you, Mr. Greensill. Um, uh, just uh, though we're at the last uh, hurdle, I'd just like to recap the first questions that the Chair asked you about Lord Miners and your meeting. And just to be very clear, um, Lord Miners told this committee uh, I was contacted by somebody who said that Lex Greensill would like to meet with me, so I went to meet with Lex Greensill. Um, am I correct in recalling your answer saying almost the opposite, that someone told you that Lord Minus wanted to meet with you so that you look met with Lord Minus? Correct. Okay. Um, what, what 
did you why did you want to meet Lord Minus? What were your motives in taking that meeting? You're running a huge company, you've got other commitments, I'm sure. Why why would you want to meet someone who was who has been quite hostile, asking very difficult questions about your company? Sure. Uh, first of all, Lord Minus is uh, a very respected member of the financial establishment, an ex-regulator. Uh, we were a growing firm. He had, as you'd said, raised questions uh, about our firm and, and, and others in, in Parliament. And uh, so I was very keen and very happy to, uh, to, to meet with him uh, because it gave us an opportunity to one, kind of learn from his views. Uh, and he has some very clear views around um, the way that open-ended funds and illiquid assets should interact with, with one another, um, which he's been outspoken on. Uh, I was very keen to ensure that he understood the nature of our business and the assets that we purchased in our business. Um, and, uh, and so we had a, a, a constructive conversation around what his concerns were, the way that our business worked. Um, and he noted um, that you know, there are risks within our business, but those risks were different to um, perhaps um, what he had initially anticipated or viewed um, that those, uh, those risks were. Um, and I certainly recognise that uh, there is and always is room for continued um, improvement in terms of compliance. Uh, and as we were growing as a, as a business, it was inevitable that we were um, moving into more regulated spaces and therefore his, his input was invaluable. He, he called you a very charming man. Did you, did you use your charm to, to kind of buy him off really, get off your back? I told him the way our business was. And uh, uh, so if he regards that as charming, um, I'm, I'm gratified that that was, uh, was his view. But was, was the, the offer of a job or the talking, you know, the, the progressing of an offer of a job, was that a genuine gap in your board capability? Or was that yes. just an ad hoc, well, this just occurred to me right now. This seems like a good idea. Look, if you were to look at, the composition of our board, you would see that we don't have um, anybody with a regulatory background uh, on our board. Um, uh, our business was growing, it was heading in the direction of potentially becoming a public company. Uh, and so therefore that expertise is expertise that we saw as valuable. Um, when uh, uh, Lord Miners ultimately declined, um, we ended up hiring a very significant regulatory expert um, as vice chairman of our firm um, in his, you know, because Lord Miners didn't uh, take that position. So I guess from that perspective, we were hiring and we did hire uh, a very significant uh, person with, with real credentials in, in that space. Did you um, relay the results of that meeting and give David Cameron a mission to, to talk to, David, uh, to Lord Myers? Um, we know that he ran into him at a meeting some weeks following that and made sure that he spoke to him. Did you give David Cameron a mission on that in that respect? No, I, I don't recall giving David Cameron a, a mission. I'm not sure I ever gave David Cameron a mission, uh, but, uh, um, but uh, I believe that Mr Cameron uh, met with Lord Miners uh, in October 2019 and my meetings, uh, as, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, were in, uh, in, in July and September of... Uh, of 2019. Thank you. One of the people who did lobby the Treasury on behalf of Greensill was uh, Bill Crothers. How did you come to employ Bill Crothers? So uh, I met Mr Crothers in connection with the fact that he was, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, he was the senior civil servant responsible for the Crown representative program of which I became one. Uh, and when uh, Mr. Crothers ceased to be uh, the Chief Procurement Officer, uh, sorry, Chief Commercial Officer, I apologise, uh, of uh, in, in the Cabinet Office, um, he and, and uh, a, a new person had been appointed to that role. Um, he was thinking of other things to, uh, to do, and I invited him to be an advisor on a part-time basis um, within, our, within our firm, and uh, he started as a uh, as an advisor to us um, after he ceased to be the, uh, um, the the chief commercial officer 
he was still the government chief procurement officer for at least two months, wasn't he? When it, there was an overlap in that uh, time in the treasury, which was being referred to by civil servants as extraordinary that that double hat position was allowed to, to happen. I mean, did you, did you think that was a conflict of interest or did you just think you were very lucky? Ms. Marston, just, just to be clear, he was no longer the chief commercial officer or chief procurement officer at the point that he became um, a part-time advisor to Greenshaw. There was no overlap. So the discussion- he, he, he continued to be, he was still an employee of the civil service, um, but he was no longer um, the uh, the chief commercial officer is my recollection of events. What was what was his role um, in the civil service at the time you employed him then? Just to be clear, I, I don't actually know what his title and role was, but uh, I think he was in a process of um, kind of helping his uh, um, replacement with their transition. But but to be open with you, um, Ms. Mars and I, I'm speculating when I when I say that. Um, I can find out exactly for you and provide you with a written answer if that would be helpful to you and the that, committee. That would, that would be very helpful because there has been a, a lot of comment about the uh, those dual responsibilities, that potential conflict of interest, the double hatting. I mean, it has been described, I think it was in uh, a previous committee, it was described by current civil servants as quite extraordinary that that was allowed to happen. So that's been talked about as if that, that was actually happening. Um, I mean, it might it might, it might have preempted the next question, which was really, did you ask Jeremy Haywood or John Manzoni, who was obviously um, uh, the, the head of the civil service uh, there, the chief executive, to approve that that position, that that overlap, that double hatting situation? Absolutely not. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Crother's consultancy was called Commercial Common Sense. Is that the vehicle that you paid him via? Was that the entity that you paid him to? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. You'll, uh, I, that wasn't a detail I came armed with uh, today. Uh, my recollection um, was that he started out when he was part-time through a consultancy entity but he became an employee um, and at the time that uh, um, he was full-time he was a, an employee of our, our company and at the time of the, um, our company going into administration he was still an employee of the company. Um, and what did he do for Green for you over this period? Sure uh, I think one important detail to to share with you is that again the time that uh, he left the civil service or so ceased to be a civil service employee was in November 2015 and the first UK government contract that we funded on um, was in I believe July 2018. Um, but Bill Crothers role was to assist us with bringing uh, order to our sales function um, on a global basis uh, and he had a, uh, a role with us once he became a full-time employee uh, of, uh, of actually heading up our, what we call origination, which is kind of fancy speak for sales. Um, so basically oversaw the, 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 the client interactions that our, our firm had with, with clients around the world. But it, that does really kind of um, cover the, the fact that he was lobbying for Green Greensill as well. What, what kind of lobbying activities did he do? What did you, what did you want him to do that, that related to his role as well and his previous role within the, the civil service? Uh, Mr Crothers wasn't lobbying government. We didn't actually have any government business uh, for the two and a half years after he joined uh, our, our company. So his focus was on private sector. Um, now, after we won the first contract that we had with, uh, with the UK government, which I should emphasise was one contrary to what was said in this committee two weeks ago, was won through a very intensive competitive process. Indeed, the actual vetting of that contract was actually conducted as a straight out auction on price, where our pricing was 40% lower than the incumbent um, and was the, the basis on which we were um, ultimately selected. But after that program was in place, Mr Crothers then um, worked within a leadership role within our earned business, which was the, the product that was 
providing daily pay to employees, um, both um, within the NHS, but, uh, but actually also we were aiming to, to develop that for the private sector as well. Okay, thank, thank you very much. I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Julie. I'd just like to quickly follow up on the lobbying questions here, Lex, um, and go back to my earlier question right at the start. So I think you said that the first time that you realised that Greensill was really in trouble was at the end of 2020. I think you may have said December, which is also uh, exactly the time that David Cameron says he first became aware that Greensill was in trouble. In his letter, his recent letter to me, he says the first time I became concerned that the company might be in serious financial difficulty was in December 2020, following a call I received from Lex Greensill. Now that, of course, is quite distant from the period during which the actual lobbying was being carried out, and hence my earlier questions about uh, what the motivation for the lobbying and trying to tap into CCFF was at that point. I think uh, you went as far as to suggest that with the pandemic, which of course ended up causing lots of problems for Greensill, um, it was helpful it would have been helpful if CCF, uh, CCFF access had been achieved in terms of um, providing additional security for the business, giving the uncertainties ahead. Was that a discussion you had with David Cameron at that time? So did you share those fears with him about the uncertainty going forward and the impact it might have on the business and therefore the fact that access to CCFF might have been useful in that specific respect? Mr. Cameron and I talked about the fact that there was uncertainty uh, in capital market liquidity, and that could absolutely affect our clients, uh, as ultimately, and the numbers prove this, uh, the volume of receivables that we purchased in 2019 was 143 billion US dollars. And the amount that we bought in 2020, incidentally enough, is actually also just a whisker over $143 billion. So um, in fact, uh, the events of COVID uh, meant that we were able to provide the same quantum of liquidity to our customers over the course of 2020 as we did in 2019, in spite of the eruptions in the market. But we didn't know in March and April um, exactly what the future would hold. I'm not sure that entirely answers my question. Let me rephrase it. So what I'm saying is perhaps put it this way. Would it be fair to say that your motivation personally in uh, lobbying the Treasury over CCFF was, yes, certainly about providing support for SMEs, but it was also about providing that additional safeguard given the uncertainties uh, that they could well have been around uh, the business at that time. And that would also have been the motivation of Mr. Cameron at that point, that he would have been concerned to have got that support on the basis that the business needed a little more certainty, a little more shoring up um, than was the case at that particular time with the pandemic taking off. Mr. Chairman, we had just uh, received um, more than one and a half billion dollars of equity investment uh, from SoftBank Vision Fund only a few months before that, there was absolutely no risk to Greensill, the company. Um, our concern was making sure that there were alternative sources of capital available if capital markets continued to be in a distressed state. Yeah, so it was a kind of hedge against what might happen if things kind of, kind of went, went the wrong way, yeah. And, and that was the reason that the Bank of England put the CCFF in place was uh, and, and why many corporates signed up for it, but then ultimately did not use it because they regarded that as a, okay. a safety mechanism, I guess, for want of a better word, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. That brings us to the end of this session. You're probably quite relieved about that, uh, Mr. Greensill, but uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, appearing before us. We've covered a lot of ground uh, today. You very generously and kindly said that you will write to us on various matters. Um, I think probably a good way to proceed here will be for us to write to you in very short order, setting out the things that we believe you've agreed uh, to um, write to us upon, uh, and also perhaps to ask uh, some other questions that may occur to us uh, after um, this session. 
Um, it's been quite robust, and I think in, in some parts it's been a very robust uh, session, but nonetheless we are a courteous committee, so we do appreciate you having uh, put yourself uh, before us uh, today and for having answered uh, the questions uh, that you have. That concludes this session. Order, order. Thank you, Chair. 18. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.